stuck in the sand thousands of miles from the North Pole way down in Florida. Yeah, I've had some As Valium. without his reindeer. Because they were so hot, they took off to the North Pole. I've been conned. There's no luxury timeshare here. The Zoo Music, the real reason Paul Robeson left America. Yep, Tom Sawyer, known for his sleeveless Hawaiian shirts. Pop, the dinner's getting away. Whack it with an oar. Why do I get the feeling a psychiatrist heard all about this decades later? Nice caboose. <laughs> Keep in mind, this was plan A. Ah, well. Guys, if you don't mind, I've got this one. Ah, yeah, appreciate great. it. Great, thanks. Oh, my God! Please, what is it? I'm going ah! over this way. I'll go that way. I'll stay around here. And if any of us figures out what the hell we are, just open your hideous black mouth parts and let out a blood-curdling shriek. Thanks. So happy, and you will help. <laughs> it's time to go. We've established that uh, we will try to make it, won't we? So children... You ah, that old familiar Santa line. Friends. We've established that uh, we will try to make it, won't we? Welcome to the Pope on Film! I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... Reverend Steve, I am the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which is an actual thing. I am a father of five kids. I've been married for surprisingly longer than I thought <laughs> I would ever be, uh, uh, without being killed. Yeah. And let's be honest there. But the jury's still uh, not out on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean she still time. had time. Yeah. Yeah, she still had time. And this is episode 154. And oh man, we've got a lot here. Uh, we're going to be talking about some rumors. I've got some holiday stuff to talk about. We're going to be uh, delving bizarrely deeply into uh, psychic abilities. I've got a oh. very, very, very strong. And important installment of Steve's historical approximations that I, I really, really feel passionately about. Uh, notes from the bookstore is is uh, something I've been telling my whole family about for uh, a week and a half now, and I'm really yeah. excited uh, about it. And homework, I have a surprising amount of that. I've got a really good uh, bit of homework. Uh, lined up for next week too but that's getting beside myself uh, uh episode 154 let's get it started bunny yes uh, if you hear any music in the background that's just eleanor uh my uh month year and a half old daughter eleanor accompanying me on the uh i don't know what it's called the annoyance machine ah yes i believe that's the name of that toy there you go. Eleanor accompanying me on the annoyance machine, which I thought we had put up. <laughs> Apparently I was wrong. So excited about that. Bunny, yes. how are you doing? How, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you? Uh, you know what? I'm good. We're good. We're, we, everything's fine. Yeah. Everything's everything's fine Every, everything is everything is great um at any second i could explode oh okay what's what's causing you to explode it's just that time at work you know it's just that time and uh I, i've gotten in i'm gonna go into more detail for a small bit in the beginning of notes from the bookstore but basically I'm getting a crazy holiday amount of stuff, and yet we're so busy. There's no one to put it out onto the floor, so mm -hmm. I'm having to I'm having to uh, get as to receive as many boxes as I can 
and then put this stuff out on the floor. But of course, the second I go out on the floor, I'm tackled by a hundred a holes uh-huh. who, who need help. And uh, for them, uh, and for many of them, this is the first and last time this year that they'll ever come into a bookstore. Oh, okay. So it's it's a difficult time, and I'm getting a massive amount of stuff, and I I don't have the time or the energy to put it out, and it, it's it's very stressful. Uh, but but I I'm fine. We're fine. We're all good. It everything's great. Everything <laughs> is great. And then and then just the holidays. And uh, hi, Eleanor. What did you just give to me? What did you just try and give to me? Whatever it is, you dropped it. You doing good, Eleanor? Eleanor is sick. Yeah. She yeah she's not feeling good. And um, when you're a year and a half old and you're not feeling good. Then when you're a year and a half, this is what you think in your head. You go, I'm not feeling good. None of you can feel good either. (laughs) Mom, you're getting no sleep and you're going to be pissed about it. And you're going to take it out on the whole family. Dad, the only thing that will make me feel better is if you take off your shirt and hold me so that you can suck in all of my sickness. (laughs) <laughs> basically i'm like the priest at the end of the exorcist yeah that's, and i'm just that's... sucking in all of this grossness anyway it, it, it's an exciting time the kids are now off of school and so uh, uh that's fun yeah for them not necessarily for anybody else (laughs) it's an it's an exciting time here at the house and uh yay Yay. first off bunny Uh bunny bunford bun in the oven right off the bat here i think that it's best that we just you know let's let's take a deep breath let's just go ahead and address all of the nasty rumors about us that have been circulating recently yeah in the press in the press Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of just beating around the bush and uh, not paying attention to the elephant in the room, you know, Mm -hmm. we're just going to be honest with our loyal listeners and just clear the air about all of these rumors and accusations that have been leveled against us, against the both of us. Uh, So, yeah, let's just let's just bite the bullet and do this. Let's just let's just do it. First off, let's get this one out of the way first. Despite what the tabloids have been saying, the tabloids, the message boards. Yeah. uh, Despite what what the press might have you believe. No. Despite that scalding TMZ report, Tom Cruise and I are not romantically involved. Oh, damn it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That that's just ridiculous. I don't even know why people would 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 come to that conclusion. There's no truth to the rumor. There's no truth to the rumor that Tom Cruise and I are romantically involved. Yeah. No truth to that rumor at all, okay? Now I'm really okay? sad. I'm really <laughs> sad. I thought I was sad before, but now I'm really sad. Oh, 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 uh, don't get me wrong. Tom Cruise and I are fucking. Oh yeah, oh. good. I like Maxwell. like like rabbits and just all the time too. I'm impressed. Like remember when Tom Cruise mm-hmm. jumped on Oprah's couch all crazy hyper about Katie Holmes? Yeah. Imagine that but in bed. <laughs> it's insane. Uh power bottom. But look, he, he you know, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that that's his thing. He he likes being punished. But look, uh <laughs> he he's He's just a boy toy, all right? There's no there's no romance there. Yeah. Cuz to be romantically involved, you'd have to get involved with Scientology and you do not want to mess with that. No, not at, at all. all ever. Yeah. You don't want to touch that at all. Now, secondly, a lot of people have been attacking Bunny recently on social media, oh, for a number of reasons, but I'm mm-hmm. not going to go into all the controversy surrounding Bunny Williams instead. I will just give the floor to you, Bunny, so that you can set the record straight. So, 
without further ado, uh, Bunny, go ahead. It was only a grapefruit. I mean, it's not like I hurt a real person or anything like that, you know. Um, and I, I, I don't think it counts if if the item cannot give consent. You know, I, I think consent can be assumed, especially from anything in the produce aisle. Mm -hmm. You know, so so it's a misunderstanding. Um, I, I, I wish people would be more liberal and more enlightened uh, about about um, man fruit romances. Good, good. Maxwell, you spilled my coffee uh, in in record time. You made a mess in record time. Go get me a paper towel, okay? Go get me a paper towel, please. I really love putting you on the spot, Bunny. <laughs> I've been trying to do it more and more often yeah. in the podcast. I mean, you're just, you're really good at it, too. <laughs> you're really, really good with me putting you on the spot for something you're in no way prepared for. You're, you're quite, you're quite good at it. You are quite good. <laughs> Able to come up with bullshit at a moment's notice, yes. Mm -hmm. Bunny. Yes. <clears throat> this will be. Uh, our last episode of 2017. So this episode is a big one. It will be dropping around Christmas-ish, and it will also end up being our New Year's episode. So I just I just wanted to touch upon both things. I wanted to touch upon Christmas and New Year's, if I may, while I still have the chance. Sure. Here at the end of 2017. First off, the closer of the two. Christmas! Christmas! I've been spending a lot more time on the floor this season at work than I did last year. And that means I've been hearing a lot more Christmas music than I usually do. Because surprise, surprise, my wife Natasha is actually not into Christmas music. What? You would have expected <laughs> that of happiness and joy to just be uh, just dripping with Christmas cheer. Yeah. Instead, actually, not that into Christmas music, my wife. Uh, I'm actually taking part in something. Uh, that I learned about uh, that some internet people are doing. It's called the Little Drummer Boy Challenge. I've the gone Little all Drummer year. Drummer Boy Challenge. Okay. Yes, I've gone all year, never having never heard the song Little Drummer Boy in any form whatsoever. Good. So uh, I was worried that if this ended up becoming one of those uh, uh, season where I'm on the floor more. That means I'm listening to more music, and there's a good chance I might hear the little drummer boy. But so far, so far, I have not heard it once, and that is good because, you know, I'm keeping my streak alive. Yes. I'm worried that at any second I could hear it, but so far I have not heard it. Very proud. If you search Little Drummer Boy Challenge on Twitter, there's a lot of, there's a lot of posts. The majority of them are, are tweets along the lines of, Damn it, I was at the mall. <laughs> Heard it in the Hallmark store. I was doing so good. So stuff but, like that. But that is the goal to to not watch Little Drummer Boy at like to not cost. watch to not watch the Little Drummer Boy or not hear any version of the song Little Drummer Boy. Uh-huh. I have not heard a single solitary version of it. And so I, I'm keeping that streak. I'm pretty sure the song doesn't play on our contemporary Christmas station at work. I But it's iffy if my work has the classic Christmas station on, because I'm pretty sure they do have in their rotation that version that uh, David Bowie did with what's his name, Bing Crosby. Yeah. Took a break from beating his kids to... <laughs> sing with a weird space person so it, it, yeah so there's a good chance the more I work the the more chance I have that I'll hear it but so far I haven't heard it Good. so so I've been hearing a lot of Christmas music and let me tell you something the music that we that we listen to not not just at work but just in general the music that we Americans listen to 
is just so boring and bland and vanilla, just so white. Yes. And especially now it's 2017, for Christ's sake. So I, I figure what we need to do, we need to spice up the Christmas music. So that's why I have been hard at work trying to update some Christmas songs with a more modern flavor. Sensibility. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got I've got three songs. Well, I've got a bit. I've been working. I've been tinkering here and there in my lab. Yes. Uh, on uh, three different new modern Christmas songs. Number one, I'm really proud of this one. I saw Daddy blowing Santa Claus. <laughs> you know, it's it's you know modern day. It's, kids, it's sweet kids nowadays yeah kids nowadays they don't have the hang-ups about sex that other generations have yeah. uh i i couldn't hear what you said because uh Sorry. natasha was doing Are something with, with chips uh, i didn't say anything okay no i heard what i thought was genie in the background oh uh, here's here, this is this is one I came up with the other day, and I'm, I'm I'm still hoping for this. All I want for Christmas is an indictment. That's another <laughs> one I'm working on. Oh, don't we all? Yeah, yeah. And then and then I started re and then then I thought you know, if if, if what I'm going for is, is uh you know Christmas songs for modern day. Well, there's no real Christmas songs for a child whose parents are getting divorced. This is true. This is true. They are they are often yeah. neglected. Yeah. So a divorced kids should have uh, a Christmas song too. So this is the one that that I that I decided to rewrite for divorced children. Christmas, the snow's coming down. Christmas, on dad's one bedroom apartment. Christmas, <laughs> because mommy left daddy. Christmas, for her hot yoga instructor. <laughs> now dad eats nothing but ramen. Yes. While mama's having hot yoga sex. Yes, mom. <laughs> they are doing it on the couch. On the couch that daddy bought. <laughs> Thank you for the backup. It's the grandma from the Rhapsody Street Kids believe in Santa, honey. Yes. That really, that really, I think, made the song. And let me tell you something, honey. I am ready. Uh, the one thing I want for Christmas, I'm ready to skate bigger and faster than my mom can make the biggest sandwiches in the world. Yeah, my yeah. yeah, yeah. See, I think you could do like something with I get two Christmases. Yeah, then, yeah, two Christmases. Yeah, I'll see. I'll see what I, I'll see what I can do there. I'll see what I can do there. So, uh, moving past Christmas is uh, New Year's. It's about to be a brand new year. Yes, and and so where we're at now. Which is like a week before New Year's ish. Mm -hmm. We are at that point in our lives where no matter where you go, you go to a website, you go to a news site, you go to CNN.com, you pick up a newspaper, you pick up a magazine, you turn on a uh, TV to watch something. No matter where you go, someone has a top 10 list now. Yes. We're in that annoying part of like, oh, I'm going to go to this website. Here's my top 20 favorite video games of 2017. Okay, then I'm going to go to CNN. Here's our list of the top 10 films of 2017. Oh, God damn it. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to read the, the Jewish review of books. Is the top 10 most Jewish books. Yes. Or whatever. Or whatever that would be. Uh... <laughs> Natasha just gave me a puzzle. <laughs> there you go. I got it out. I got it out. You're welcome. So, since we're at that point where everyone is writing top ten lists, best albums, best movies, yada, yada, yada. Here's my list. 
Okay. I decided to go ahead and make a list. Bella helped me write this. She she was instrumental in helping me write this. My top ten favorite episodes of the Pope on Film podcast this past year. Oh, okay. so this is my list. My list of the top ten best episodes of the Pope on Film in 2017. Ten great, wonderful episodes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Number 10 was that one episode where where we where we covered a, like a bad movie yeah. and then we made fun of it like you remember that episode? I do. That was that was a good episode. I, I totally remember that episode and it was really good. Yeah, and that was movie really was just so awful. Oh yeah, it was a bad movie and we just made fun of it. Yeah. You know, cuz we take we take risks like that. <laughs> yes, we do. So that's number 10. Uh, number nine, my number nine favorite episode of the Pope on Film podcast in 2017 was that one episode where you said that one funny thing, you remember? Oh, God, yeah. People you said still that one talk funny about thing. that. Yeah. And then, like, I was laughing, and now people still come up to me, and they're like, hey, Steve, you remember that one episode where Bunny said that one funny thing? And I'm like, ah. <laughs> and then they go, ah. And then the police come because we're just two grown adults going, ah, <laughs> that, was, that was a good episode. That That's number nine. Yes. Uh, num- number eight, this episode really stood out. It was the one episode where Natasha just talked for 20 minutes about Supernatural. Oh, that that was good. Yeah, that was surprising because Natasha usually doesn't like to talk about Supernatural. Yeah. But this one episode, she just she just talked about it, and that's good because we we hardly talked at all about Misha Collins in 2017. So no. he, he so was it, quite it, neglected. Yeah, he was quite neglected. Yeah, so I'm happy that finally, you know, we made America, you know, love again, basically. Mm-hmm. Is what we did with that. So uh, thank you to Natasha. That's m- number eight. Who knew? Number- who who knew that buying the world a Coke would actually work? Yeah, yeah. Nobody oh. had any idea. That. Yeah. My number seven favorite episode of the Pope on Film podcast in 2017 was the one where Eleanor wouldn't stop screaming, and that's so funny because usually when we do the podcast, she's just sitting quietly in a chair typing her manuscript. Yes, but very, there very was the hard at work episode. and dedicated. She is. Yeah, there was the one episode where Eleanor was like, "Wait a second, maybe I should scream during this episode." I don't know if I should. I've never done it before. Well, I'll give it a shot, and then she just started screaming like crazy. Yeah, which is weird. Which is weird because usually when the baby makes a single peep, suddenly my two teens are out of their room, bounding out of their room like superheroes, ready to quiet the baby down. That happens all the time. Yeah, I'm sure. But I guess I guess for just this one episode, they dropped the ball. <laughs> my number six favorite episode of the Pope on Film in 2017 was the one where Max had a bunch of special guests. Yes. Max, my six-year-old, most of the time he's just uh, sitting in the corner watching me do the podcast in awe, but this time he just said, you know what? I'm going to line up about six special guests, which is weird because that just never happens. No. Not at all. And and good guests, too. There was like uh, Iron Man and, 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 and Venom and Joe Don S- Baker, some unnamed superhero that somebody got from the dollar store. Yeah, leaving Captain, Cle- Captain Mediocre. I think he is. Um, <laughs> did she just sneeze on your face? All over me. That sounded like a very good sneeze too. Like she <laughs> was going strength and distance. Like all she's over me. well. All hands on deck if she's going to make it to regionals, honey. Oh, my was... face didn't need to be involved. <laughs> she sneezed in my mouth the other day. I want to put that on a shirt and have you just wear that around because that should be your catchphrase. <laughs> my face shouldn't be involved. 
<laughs> dirty. It could be cleaned. Like it could go so many ways. That's a great phrase. Put that on a bumper sticker. Slap it on the van. My face shouldn't be involved. It didn't need to be. My face didn't need to be involved. Yeah, yeah. That's your new catchphrase. Okay. <laughs> I'm giving everybody new catchphrases. Maxwell's new catchphrase is slap that, Grandma. <laughs> it's slap that, comma, Grandma, not slap that, Grandma. Yeah. Ain't a talk over there and slap that, Grandma. <laughs> no, you, you gotta say it right. You should tell Maxwell to slap his grandma. Oh. I meant your mom. Oh, my oh! mom. Okay, okay, because your mom's <laughs> Cause dead. Because my mom's dead. Your mom's dead, yeah. Um... Does it, does it mean you can't slap her? That's a we good do point. have her ashes. You can slap an urn. It just takes yeah, a bit have... more work and a bit more dedication. Yeah. Well, we have ashes. Yeah. We yeah. could we could make an urn in her... Do we have a mold of her head? Do we yeah. have a mold of her head? I'll, I'll check my lab. <laughs> can we take a picture into a place and have them do... A mold type thing of her head, and just like have Nana's head with her filled with her ashes. I bet with three D printers you can get it done. Oh my god, <gasps> you're right. Yeah. I wonder if I know somebody. With... I mean, if they can, if they can, if they can three D print dildos, I'm pretty. Yeah, sure if they can three D print, they can three D print my mom's face. Like a like a like a like somebody's a, a new arm for someone. Yeah. There's a group out there that 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 has 3D printers and uses them to print 100% accurate superhero arms for kids who have lost an arm or a limb. I know. Really? And I'm just hoping. Yeah, I'm just hoping that they do adults. If I lose an arm, I want a Winter Soldier arm. Korean. <laughs> it's got like the red star on the corner. I'm, if I lose an arm, heaven forbid I do. But if I do, I'm getting me a Winter Soldier arm. I've actually thought a lot about this, like a ridiculous amount about how cool I would look with my Winter Soldier. Arm. I would need a lot more um, wife beaters. <laughs> Sorry, wife, wife huggers. Wife huggers. Wife huggers. Wife huggers. What do I want from Sonic? A uh, burger? Big burger? Fries? Not tater tots. I don't like the tater tots. Fuck tater Fries. tots. And if possible, also oh, a hot dog. got some feelings about tater tots. Fuck tater tots and their stupid asses. Wow, bunny. Tell us how you really feel. Yeah, that's I I I don't even feel that. <laughs> right. I mean, like, I think potatoes in almost any form are good. So Oh, oh, uh Eleanor. I like I like okay. potatoes. Okay, I'm holding Eleanor. Okay, so you want a burger? You don't want the bur the, the Coney Island dog like you always get? Or whatever? Can I get both? Can I punch you in your face? Uh, I'm just kidding. I mean, I, if I'm bringing your mold over to the, the, the dude's house, yeah. I don't have to feed him all, so okay, yes. I can get you both. Yes. Yes. So should I surprise you on the burger then? Yes. And get you a Coney Island dog? Yeah. I want a cheeseburger. So, uh, let's see. So my five, yes, we're on number five. Okay. My number five favorite episode of the Pope on Film this past year was that one episode where we did like a blockbuster funny you remember? We did like a we did like a like a popular movie. Yeah, that really one popular movie, that one movie that everybody yeah. was talking about. Yeah. And then yeah. we had like a we And that like really movie. pulled in the listeners too. Yeah, we it, it was a really intri we had a different take on it because we watched this popular movie and then we said, Hey, this is pretty good. And that's what people want. Mm -hmm. to listen to is to hear that uh, exciting different take on things so yes. that was an episode number four in my top ten list of best episodes of the Pop Punk film this past year was that one episode where that one thing happened and then we, we were both like <gasps> do you remember? I, I, I'm still shocked yeah 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 People, people are still talking about that to this day, that one episode where that one thing happened. My number three favorite episode of the Pope on Film this past year, episode 150, Stephen King's It. 
Yes. It was a solid, well-rounded episode that I was very proud of. Number two, the number two favorite episode of the year was the one where uh, where Bella that one episode where Bella killed all those puppies that I I, I was I was shocked and I think you were right to ground her I I, I couldn't yeah. listen to that yeah. I couldn't listen yeah yeah. I, yeah she she killed like 24 puppies within the course of the podcast and so I had to be like hey Missy you're grounded for two days <laughs> The, the sh- and I had to like get down on her for that. It was the squealing that was really, really difficult. That was that was yeah. the really hard part. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, and then, of course, the number one best episode of this podcast throughout 2017 is this episode. We're only about 25 minutes into it, but already, this is the best episode of the year. You could just tell, you know, you just have that feeling, you know, that that kind of like electric, you know, feeling. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's how you can always tell. Yeah. So that's my top 10 list, and it's going to be my only top 10 list. (laughs) So I don't do like my favorite movies of the year or anything like that. My favorite albums. Like, no, no, I'm done. Eleanor, can you? Stop trying to push the podcast off of this table. I would appreciate that. I'm talking to Bunny. Say hi, Bunny. Say hi. Hi, you Eleanor. Can have, you cannot have the Lysol wipes. Why do you want the Lysol disinfecting wipes so much? Hi, Bunny. Uh, yes, yes. Hey, Eleanor? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Eleanor, say hi. I'm going to today. Yes, Eleanor is sick today. Yes, Eleanor is sick today. She doesn't want to say hi. Uh, don't touch. Don't touch. I have a playlist for Eleanor on YouTube, and she likes watching it. And there's a lot of Sesame Street stuff. She really likes old Pink Panther cartoons, so yeah. we watch a lot of that. And uh, <laughs> new Mickey Mouse cartoons, Eleanor really likes that. And... um. Bits and pieces of various movies and some bizarre musical uh, music videos, but what? But I every once in a while I'll sneak a Bob's Dirty Shorts in there. Oh yeah, yeah. So she'll be watching a Mickey Mouse cartoon, then a Bugs Bunny cartoon, then Elmo <laughs> singing a song, and then don't you judge me. <laughs> don't judge me. You've got no right judging me. That's right. That's so funny. every time that comes on, <laughs> Eleanor knows. She just she hears the voice and she goes, oh, "Bunny, bunny. <laughs> bunny." And then the video's over, and I say, "Say, say goodbye to Bunny," and she goes, "Bye, bye." Oh, <laughs> it's really adorable. Yeah, Eleanor loves you. Oh, thank you, Eleanor. Bunny. Yes. I'm going off script here to have a bizarre discussion about psychic abilities. Okay. Specifically, my massive psychic abilities, because I I have uh, massive psychic abilities. I I had this conversation with Natasha. A lot of times when I'm talking to Natasha or when I'm talking to Bella or when I'm talking to to, uh, Emerald, I'm actually trying out a bit for the podcast. Yeah. But this, this... This conversation was actually, I was just about to jump in the shower and I was just thinking about something. And so I decided to just talk it out with Natasha and she talked it back with me and and we had an interesting conversation. I thought, you know what? I'm going to see if I can bring this conversation into the podcast. Yes, Maxwell, you've been saying dad nonstop for about three minutes. Yes, Maxwell. Yes. Yes, Maxwell. I uh, want to... Rub my feet? No. Oh, you, you wanted to tell me something? Wow, that's tell them something. Oh, uh, okay. What do you want to tell them? Okay, I just want to say, whoever is watching this, listening to it, listening to this, <laughs> you should do my, uh, you know, join your what? Team. Join your team? Yeah. And uh so if you 
go go like my video go so go go like my video and and be on my team because when you like my video it'll you'll be on my team okay uh, I thought I was already on your team Maxwell yeah. Aren't yeah, we? You know yeah right but anybody else out there? Anybody else? Because Bunny and I are on your team, Maxwell. That's right. We are so on your team. <laughs> so, Jesus, Maxwell. Wow. Uh, Bella, can you help him pick that up? Maxwell, don't you leave it. You dropped that. You dropped that big, huge thing. Pick it up. Dude. So, psychic abilities. Yes. I was thinking about psychic abilities. Okay, wait a minute. Is that psychic abilities or psycho abilities? Psychic. Yeah. Okay. Psychic Just want to make that clear. Ability. And I've been thinking about this lately because I, I have had some abilities. I'm not saying I'm psychic. I'm just saying I, I have had a few instances in which I have seen uh, when I may or may not have seen the future, yeah. and I, I honestly believe that I'm not psychic, but that it, these events are more proof than some of the people out there who say they're psychic who are, in fact, uh, just lying through their teeth, like the Long Island medium and shit like that is yeah. what I'm thinking. So, it, 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 just leave it, just guys, leave it alone, leave it alone, just leave it alone, just leave it alone, just leave it alone. No. I'm trying to move this thing. Okay. 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 But that's not how it was. Okay. So no one can ever move the chair is what you're saying, Bella. Okay. Stop making this thing he dropped into a big thing, everybody. Too bad. Jesus. So much drama in this house. So like I was in a I was in a robbery what seven years ago, and uh, it, when I was about to clock in, I felt a, a a sense of dread and unease, and so I got on my Facebook page, and right before I clocked in on the night that I was in a robbery, I said, "I do not feel good. I feel paranoid, as if something bad is about to happen." I wrote that on my Facebook page. Then the right before a robbery happened, yeah, and that that is a coincidence or it could be proof of psychic ability another psychic thing that happened to me um is that i purchased this this really nice expensive uh collector's item toy thing that they don't even make anymore and i i i bought it like during the summer and then i hid it so that i could use it that christmas as a christmas gift but then i lost it period and i yeah. couldn't find it and I didn't find it again in, in, until the beginning of this year. And I said, hey, I found this Christmas gift from like two years ago. Uh, who should we give it to? And then I, I panicked because I got it for like a young Bella. And now she's not so young. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a, who which, do I which give? I'm, which I'm still very upset with her about. Yeah, to, I'm, to I'm kind honest, of poor. You know, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of pissed too. So I'm like, who do I give this to? It's January. Who do I give this to? But you know what? This is what I'm going to do. We can't figure out who will give this as a present to. So we'll just we'll just put it away. I'll put it in my car. That way we'll, you know, we won't lose it. And uh, I don't know, maybe by the end of the year, there'll be somebody in the house that's really obsessed with Inside Out that we can buy this, that we can give this to as a present. Who knows? Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, it's already getting old that movie. You yeah. Know? So, so I mean, you know how so, kids are. Yeah. So what I was thinking of, what I was thinking of, is I was thinking of like, oh wow, look at my psychic ability. But then I thought, this isn't psychic. It's just that I feel that I am more open to the multiverse or to the concept of multiverses yes. for for example like the other day i pulled i pulled into the i pulled my car into the you know to the i parked it in front of my house mm -hmm. and i was going to just jump out of the car but first i was like oh wait 
Uh, let me see if I have my phone. Oh, wait, my phone's in my pocket. Okay, then. So I was about to, to just uh, whip my door open, and some guy just sped past going down my street, going like 55, and he was very close to hitting me. And if I had just whipped the door open, uh, an accident could have happened. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's close. But at the moment that that happens to me, where, where I'm like, oh, the, that that was a that was almost an accident. In my mind, I can see a, a multitude of possibilities. Yeah. Like Such I can as? see, like I can see the me where the my car door got ripped off. Yeah. Or I can see the me where the guy. It ripped off the car door and kept going. I can see the me where the guy ripped off my car door and that caused him to crash into a, a house yeah. or into a light post. Or I can see the me where I flip the door open, I whip my door open and then get out and I get hit. Oh. Or I can see I can see the me that gets uh, hurt and slightly injured. I can see the me that gets killed. I can see the me where I'm fine, but this guy dies. I can see a multitude of possibilities, and that happens to me all the time during everything. If I'm like doing something and oh, I almost dropped that, I can see the me that drops that. Oh, okay. So then I started thinking, what if, like, this could be like uh, like a like a like a science fiction book or at the very least a sci-fi channel movie. Yes. What if psychic ability is real, but it's not psychic ability as much as it is seeing a multitude of possibilities unfolding in front of you, like a choose your own adventure novel. Yes. And, mm -hmm. And being able to kind of, predict what's going to happen by seeing the multitude of and natasha said that 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 has to be horrible every thing you do you can see the alternatives kind of unfolding in front of you yeah you can see the multiple outcomes thank you bella yeah. that's got to be like a that would drive you insane but also, it would uh -huh. probably also keep you safe, or me, or it could it could keep you safe. It could save your life, or you could go insane, or you could probably find a way to make money off of it. Either way, that's got to be horrible. <laughs> I, I I would I would think so. I you know, how could it not be? Yeah. Anyway, this is just what I've been thinking of lately. There's no point to it. I have no ending. I'm not on script right now. This is just what I've been thinking of. Yeah. It's, there's a there's a there's a multitude of of possibilities around us at all times. If you almost get into an accident, there's definitely a you out there where you got into that accident. A multitude of youths that got into that accident and then some of them end in death. I wonder how many of me has died so far. I don't know. What, what uh, is the death toll? Like, basically, my life is just someone out there playing the game Roy, a life well lived. <laughs> <laughs> that when I die, some kid is going to take off a helmet. Oh, 87 years, not bad. <laughs> yeah. So, Bunny. Yes. It is time once again. For us to open up our history books with another learned packed installment. I didn't think of that ahead of time. I probably should have worded that better. With another installment of Steve's Historical Approximations. All right. This is a vaguely reoccurring segment of the Pope on Film podcast, wherein I get a portion of history and retell it. In my own voice, so it's not necessarily 100% true, but it's like 92 to 97% true. And it's this true time, enough. Yeah, it's true it's enough. It's true-ish. Yeah. And this time around, we will be talking about one of our nation's, nay, one of the planet's most important film directors, 
that no one has ever fucking heard of. Okay. This person is amazing and incredible and phenomenal. I learned about her by reading a uh, a travel book. I was just uh, shelving travel books, and I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna look through this." And there was her name right there in the in the middle of this travel book. And I'm like, "Really? I need to learn about this person." And I've just been telling people at work about her. It, it, it's it's incredible. This week we will be learning about Florence L. Weber. Okay. Better known Never as heard of her. Better known by her stage name Lois Weber, one of the most amazing and influential uh, uh, women in the history of Hollywood. And it's a shame, an absolute shame that no one knows this person. Maxwell's being real loud, and I want to tell him to stop, but he's actually getting Eleanor to laugh, and that's wonderful because she's been super sick. Yeah. So, uh, you know what? Yeah, so so I'll just I'll allow it. So it's the early 1900s, and a young woman from Pittsburgh is a street preacher. Okay. Apparently that's... Good. That was a thing. Think, think uh, the it's beginning of God... Yeah, think the beginning of Guys and Dolls, though. They're on the street, they're singing, they're passing out literature, let's do another song, let's do some dancing, let's let's start preaching. So she's on the street corner, she's singing hymns, she's preaching, she and her peeps in the American <laughs> Church Army Workers Association are traveling to big cities, singing and preaching. They would get church organs and... Uh, push them and church into... organists. Did yeah, they have church, church organ. organists as yeah, well? Yeah, they would have church organists for their church yeah. organ. They would have church organists. And they would get these big ass church organs and push them into the red light districts. And so they would be on the street corner playing in front of like brothels and shit in yeah. New York in like 1902 and stuff. So then the, the Church Army Workers Association disbands, but this young woman. Florence L. Weber, she's all, hey, I'm actually pretty good at singing and crap. Maybe I could be a performer of some kind. So apparently she was a prodigy when she was younger. So she 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 go, becomes a music student. She's learning how to uh, play instruments. And so she, in in her early 20s, she's so good at music that soon... She's traveling across America performing. She's singing. She's playing piano. And she's really making a name for herself. She's becoming famous. If she kept going, uh -huh. then by her 30s, she could have been like one of America's most famous pianists, traveling performers. Uh, that is until Charleston, South Carolina. Uh -oh. she's, doing, she's doing this big show. One of her biggest performances ever. She's playing the piano, and in the middle of the song, one of the piano keys just fucking flies off the piano. <laughs> one key just breaks the fuck up mid mid song, mid show, and she was so distraught. She was so uh, just fucked up by this weird, crazy, random happenstance that she never played piano again. Oh my god. Was it demons? I don't know. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. But she's like, okay, so no to music. What about acting, though? So uh, Florence L. Weber moves to New York to become an actress. She Apparently, there's already a Florence Weber, so she goes by her middle name. So she's Lois Weber now. She's in a bunch of theatrical performances, a bunch of plays. Eventually, she meets a fellow actor, Philip Smalley. They really hit it off and they get married. But after they get married, they continue to perform. And their whole thing was, oh, we perform together. And for whatever reason, it's like 1906, 1908. And apparently people were really digging that. And I'm like, hey, you guys are a couple. And <laughs> it's 1908. Everybody talks like this right now. Hey, what's up with that? You know, you know, that that quick speaking sort of. Yeah. Like early 1900s. So so they would they would perform together under the name the Smalleys. 
the smallies. Hmm. Oh, this this play, The Importance of Death's Question, featuring the smallies. That's odd. Can you imagine doing that now? Like Mr. and Mrs. Smith starring The Pits. <laughs> That's just weird. You wouldn't imagine a husband and wife performing together in a movie or in a play now under the husband's last name. Yeah. That just that wouldn't happen now. That's just weird, right? Uh, very weird. You, you, you haven't, I, I can't remember the last time we've seen that. Maybe a Steve and Edie Gourmet. Yeah. Yeah, but, but like if they were just the Gourmets. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so so here's well, where I'm they, sure that's what they wrote down on like party invitations and things like that. Yeah. You yeah. know, Christmas cards and things like that. You know, you write out your list. You're going to write the gourmets, you know? Yeah. 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 So here's where things here's where things get big for fucking Laura, Lois, Lois Weber. Hollywood is slowly but surely becoming an actual thing. Yeah. So there's a uh, one or two big movie studios, and then there's like ten really small movie studios. So five of these medium-sized film studios say, "Hey, what if we join together? Because you're like a medium-small size studio. You're a medium-small size studio. You're a medium-small size studio. What if we join together, and we can be? If we join together, then suddenly." Uh, uh, we five small uh, film studios will become like this big, will become like one of the biggest film studios in the universe. Yeah. So they named themselves the Universal Film Manufacturing Company. And eventually, they shorten it to just Universal Studios. But that's the birth of Universal Studios. This is, it, I originally learned this story as a small two paragraph blurb in a guidebook to Universal Studios Orlando. Really? Okay. Yeah. It, it's interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a travel guide with a lot of pictures about uh, the 2018 guide to Universal Studios Orlando. But in the beginning of the book is like a 25-page essay on the history of the Universal Studios. And so I, I like flipping through that and saying, hey, if I if my family ever goes to Universal Studios in or in Orlando or in Hollywood for that matter, mm -hmm. I will tell all of my kids, you are not allowed to go until you read this essay and write a report. <laughs> Cause I am not gonna take you kids to Universal Studios and then suddenly you see uh the creature from the Black Lagoon and you're like, Who's that? No. Yeah. No. If we're walking through Universal Studios and you see a, a street sign that says Todd Browning Street, God damn it, you're going to know what that means. Yes. I'm not. Uh, I, I ain't playing here. You <laughs> SOBs. So, so, yeah, it was like a tiny two paragraph blurb in that book. So it, it, the Universal Film Manufacturing Company is desperately looking for some talented people to make some things for their brand new studio. They tap the smallies together to start cranking out shorts, one to two real films. And the smallies have a, a, all of their films are real high class, high concept, sophisticated stuff, yeah. costumes and stuff. But eventually, smug fucking bastards. Yeah. Yeah. But eventually, and this is a shock because remember, women can't even freaking vote yet. Yes. The people at Universal Studios, Carl Lamel, chief among them, they, they bring Philip Smalley and Lois Weber, they bring the Smalleys into the studio and they say, hey, uh, you guys have done a number of shorts for us, but we need, what we need now is our directors. And uh, we've seen the both of you work. We've seen the two of you work. We we love the team of the Smallies, but uh, it's obvious who the person here is with all the talent. Congratulations, yeah. Lois Weber. You're our newest director. <laughs> Women can't vote, and yet suddenly 
Lois Weber becomes their chief director at Universal Studios. Good, for, very good for her. And it's like 1912, 1913, and, and Lois Weber is like, what should my, what do you want my next film to be about? And then, again, like women don't even have the right to vote yet, but Universal, Universal Studios is like, you know what? You write it, you direct it, you make the film you want to make, Lois. What do, <laughs> what, what do Lois Weber's films, what should your films be about? So she starts making her own <laughs> about whatever she wants. In 1914, she does a high-class, four-reel, silent film version of William Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. It's the first feature film to ever be directed by a woman. Nice. Ever. Meanwhile, over a hundred years in the future, over a hundred years past Lois Weber's Merchant of Venice, they just nomin they just announced the Golden Globes. Not a single female was nominated for directing anything. No movies, no TV shows, no nothing. Yeah. And yet a hundred years it, it it almost feels as if women had more of a creative right in 1914 in Hollywood than they do now. And that's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I would totally have to agree. I mean, you know, how many, how many women go through the grinder? I can't think of any good examples here. Yeah, so Lois Weber ended up directing what IMDb estimates is about 135 films. 135? Wow. It's tough to find detailed records, though, because it's like 1915 we're talking about here. It's not like people were taking 100% detailed records. There wasn't an IMDb in 1915. Yeah. So she was a pioneer. And, and you got to remember... Hollywood was just starting out so she decided for one of her first films she was going to make a suspense film you know what she <laughs> called the film what suspense well it wasn't taken I, yet I, that's awful awesome. yeah 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 there, there weren't many suspense films that had been made up to that point so she's like I'm gonna make a suspense film I'm gonna call it suspense <laughs> so 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 she 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 said okay so She's on the phone here. She's on the phone to someone. And uh, it's a very important call. But then someone starts spying on the call. So this is what I want to happen in this, in this scene in the film. On one side of the screen, you see this woman talking on the phone. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the screen, you see the person she's talking to. And then the studio's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean... We split a screen? That's never been happened before. That's never <laughs> happened before. It's 1913. We can't do a split screen. <laughs> Who's, uh, no one's heard of that. We can't do split screens. And she's like, I'm Lois Weber, damn it. I have a vagina. So they're like, okay, let's see if we can do it. So yeah, she did the first ever split screen. Nice. Movie. She, Ryan she, De Palma owes her a, a very big debt. Yeah, yeah. She's a ridiculous pioneer. A ridiculous pioneer. In 1913, she started experimenting with sound. Yeah. In 1913, for shit's sake, she was trying to get sound in her movies. In 1918, she directed the first ever Tarzan movie. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The first ever Tarzan that was ever on uh, it, it, on the silver screen was her. She just said, hey, there's this book. It's it's called Tarzan the Ape Man. I want to do it. Whoa, you want to get a book and turn it into a movie? Calm down there, lady. It's 1918. We can't just get books and turn them into movies. Well, I guess we'll trust you. After all, you are the Lois Weber. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that has some collateral. Yeah, in her 135 ish film, she also may have been one of the first people to use Hollywood to combat social ills. She's spreading off her shit. She did. Uh, let me smell you. You smell good. Yeah, you smell sensient. 
she 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 used her films to combat social ills and champion societal issues. She was like D.W. Griffith, but without all the KKK crap. <laughs> yeah. She just she was one of the first directors to, and definitely the first female director to ever say, I want my films to teach people and to prove a point. But but other people were like, yes, I want to do that, too. My film's going to be about how drugs are bad and people shouldn't have sex. But she went in a completely different route, in a completely different route. In 1916, in 1916, she made a film that was uh, that was about abortion. Really? In 1916, it was a film that tried to teach people, hey, uh, uh, you know, practicing uh, safe sex, this is good. So in 1916, she made a movie. It was called Where Are My Children? 1916, okay, it's important. Where Are My Children? My God, that, that title is a little on the chilling side. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it, it is when you get to it. Again, 1916, okay? Yeah. 1916! So, <laughs> so here's the plot. The film concerns District Attorney Richard Walton, who is prosecuting an abortion doctor. Uh-huh. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and he's like, oh, you perform abortions. You perform illegal abortions, and that's horrible. You, you, you know, we, we need to send you in jail. And and I need to see your records so I can see all the people who you've given abortions to because we need to shame these people for being horrible. Yes. And the doctor's like, no, you can't do that. Uh, you'll have to put me in jail to do that. And so this district attorney is getting all this praise for fighting this abortion doctor. Meanwhile, his uh, wife is going, hey, you know, maybe you should just leave the guy alone. You know, maybe maybe the people who've got these abortions, maybe, you know. The, they're they're not one hundred percent happy and excited with getting these abortions, but like you don't want to shame these people. And he's like, no, you don't understand. I need to put this person in jail. And so, it, during the course of the trial, eventually the district attorney uh, throws the throws the abortion doctor in jail, gets a hold of the records, and finds out that his own wife as well as most of her friends got an abortion from this guy. Yeah. Dun, dun, and, the, dun. and the title of the film is what the DA yells at his wife after learning about it. What does he yell? The title, oh, where are my where, children? Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, that seems pretty heavy handed, man. A film about abortion. When was this movie made again? 1978, 1969. Oh, yeah, 1916. <laughs> it's safe to say that the censors didn't like her. I I would think not. Her, hey, she made another film in 1916. But those, but those were the good days before before there was any kind of haze code or anything like that. You, you find yes, a lot so- of fucking strange shit with... Um, with silent movies well like look at Haxon and how just gross it was yeah her 1916 film entitled shoes was all about prostitution <laughs> all right and uh yeah so uh, a lot of the Hayes code was about a lot of things but when they made the <laughs> in the back of their minds was freaking uh 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 lois <laughs> Lois Weber, yeah, because of sure. the things she did. Now that brings us to her best known work. Yeah, the 1915 film "The Hypocrites." The hypocrite. Hmm. It's all about my. Christ- it's all about Christianity. Nice. <laughs> It's it's very anti Christianity, but that's not the thing that pissed people off. No. Okay. The film starts with a medieval monk. Again, this is 1950. 
The film starts with a medieval monk, and he's been working for years and years and years in isolation, going mad, working on this giant, massive statue that he's been carving out of rock. And he, he says that that he's he has seen truth. He has seen the face of truth. He knows what truth is. He knows what truth looks like. And so he just this medieval monk just locks himself away and he's working on this statue that 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 will be that will be the ultimate representation of truth. And he's working on it and working on it and working on it. And finally, the, the whole village comes together because he's done with the statue and he's going to unveil it. So the whole village is there and he, he finishes it. And the statue is a graphic statue of a naked woman. <laughs> and so it, it's like, hey, it's the medieval times. You can't make a you can't make this statue a naked woman. The 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 crowd gets angry and kills the monk. Ooh, that's that's yeah, pretty stiff. Okay. There. Cut to the modern day. And there's a pasture. There, there's a pastor, not a pasture. <laughs> it's a pastor of like a big, huge cathedral type mega church, and it's a bunch of Christians, and they they only care about being seen as Christians instead of actually acting like Christians. They do, They're all horrible people. Yeah, but they just want to be seen driving their. You know looking their best and going to church and praying. So then the con the congregation one Sunday is visited by the naked truth who exposes all of the congregation's faults and flaws and sins in like a, like a montage way. The naked truth uh, walks through the church and you see each person's flaw. Oh, this person's cheating on his wife. This person is, uh, this person is uh, stealing from his company. This person is a liar. This person hates poor people. This person's a racist. This person's gay, yada, yada, yada. Um, But the naked truth that visits the church is exactly like the monk statue, played by a naked woman, literally, head to toe, full frontal nudity. The first ever Hollywood nude scene ever. (laughs) Nice. In 1915. It's actually like a scathing attack at Christianity, but if you find out anything about it, it's, uh, what would happen if a naked woman were to walk through a church? That's the plot of the film The Hypocrites. That's exactly how the travel book described this film. Oh, that sounds that's awful. Not, but that's, not what, the, that's yeah. not what the film is about. That's just what it's known for. For the first time ever in Hollywood, in 19-frickin'-15, they showed the first ever fully nude scene. Nice. In fact, historians say that the, the fact that the director was a woman helped the film get released. There's no way the film would have been released if it was a man. Yeah. Who had made the film. And let me tell you, In New York City, there were literal riots at this film. Yeah? Cool. People weren't ready to go to a movie and see any sort of nudity, let alone full frontal nudity. The the first time ever, there were riots in New York when it was released. A number of states banned it. In Boston, the mayor demanded that they get the film. And they, they they painted clothes over each frame of the woman nude <laughs> gumby style you know how gumby's do those crappy special effects yeah yeah they gumbied clothes on her oh. 1915 bunny <laughs> this woman is a hollywood hero nay a yeah. saint. she has a she has a wall she has a star on the hollywood walk of fame but nowadays, nowadays, hardly anyone remembers this woman or her work, which is a damn shame. She was literally, for a number of years, she was the highest paid director in Hollywood, period. Yeah. And that's ridiculous, because nowadays, what, what is Hollywood doing? Oh, man, we, we need to make... Uh, we need to make this Wonder Woman movie. Should we get a female to direct it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We never hire females. Okay, well, we'll hire a female to 
to to write and direct this film, Wonder Woman. Uh, but oh, what are you doing? Don't give her a three. Don't give her a three picture deal like we give the men. Mm-hmm. Here's 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 a here's a deal to direct one <laughs> film. You you don't get our standard three picture deal, female director. We'll sign you up for one Wonder Woman movie, and then we're cutting you off because you have a vagina. <laughs> oh, oh, wait. Wonder Woman has become uh, the biggest uh, superhero movie for this studio. Great. Well, we'll sign her up for one more movie. And that is it. Oh. I'm sorry. Just because you had one of the biggest hits of the year doesn't mean we're going to give you a multi-picture deal person with a vagina. Mm-hmm. And that's bullshit. Yeah. But in like 1918, she was the highest paid director, period. She was getting about $500,000 a week in like Ooh. 1916. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's Those are, rolling in the shit. Yeah. Those are huge freaking numbers. It's amazing. Everyone should know this badass woman, especially now that it's 100 years later and women directors are still fighting for equality. In 1917, with a bit of backing from Universal Studios, Lois Weber literally started her own goddamn film studio. Yeah. Lois Weber Productions. Yeah. Yeah. A- 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 any crossover to Mary Pickford? Because she was a real incredibly uh, strong woman in the silent yeah. film era. Not that I know of. I've got a picture of her I meant to send to you. But, uh, but, but yeah, they, they interviewed like Carl Lamel back in the day and they're like, what, why are you, why are you giving uh, money to Lois Weber so that she can uh, uh, run a competing film studio. And he said, basically, I would trust Lois Weber with any amount of money to do whatever she wanted because she is a genius. Nice. Yeah. I love this woman. I love this woman. Lois Weber. She is one of the most important people in the history of Hollywood, and no one has any idea who she is. Yeah. She I, actually, I had I had no idea. Yeah. For her abortion film, Where Are My Children, any time there was a a woman that was pregnant in the film, what she did is she superimposed like a small picture of a baby or a fetus over the woman that was pregnant during the movie. Yeah. So like so like in the film Where Are My Children, if like a a, a wife gets pregnant, but then oh, I better not tell my husband cuz I don't know if I'm going to keep it. Throughout the movie you see this ghost child over the woman's shoulder. Ooh. And it stays there until she gets the abortion. Really creepy. That's yeah, that's pretty fucking brutal. Yeah. And when was that movie made again? 1916. <laughs> she was like in a different she was on yeah. a whole nother level uh charlie chaplin's like i'm gonna make a film about a poor man who eats a shoe <laughs> meanwhile across town this woman is like okay my next film is gonna be about a uh, uh drug addicted prostitute who kills a man in self-defense <laughs> Yeah. 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 So Lois Weber, she is freaking amazing. Look her up. <laughs> it, it Hollywood has to make that movie now. I, I I think. Yeah. Now is the time to do this. Now is the time. And especially yeah. since more women in history are like coming to light. Yeah. You know, the ones that usually catch my attention are are all the women from NASA that we had never heard of. Yeah. And that is Steve's historical approximation around. Uh, Next time you see a female director or nudity or a split screen or a woman who's being haunted by a ghost fetus, be sure and thank pioneering female film director Lois Weber. Yeah. 
Nice. Lois Weber. Nice. I, I think you've done the world a service today. I think so, too. This is an amazing story. I love yeah. this woman. She kicks ass. Totally. So, so we still have a, a lot to talk about. We still have uh, a passionate notes from the bookstore. We still have to talk about Alexander Hamilton and um, cancer. Yeah, that's going to be. And how, how uh, often those two names go into the same breath? Yeah, Alexander yep. Hamilton. We're going to be cancer. talking about Christian propaganda and Panera Bread <laughs> and. Uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, Riff Tracks. We have so much still lined up. But before we get to any of that, should we take a break, Bunny? Yeah. Is your name Bunny Maxwell? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so, shoosh! <laughs> shoosh! Okay? I need you to zip it, lock it, put it in your pocket. <laughs> Bunny. Williams, yes. the person I am talking to right now. Yes. Do you, Bunny, and nobody else, <laughs> do you think that we should take a break? Yes. I, I said sure. Well. <laughs> yeah. I think we should take a break. I am going to yes. take that advice, Bunny, and nobody else. <laughs> I want I to do my podcast. Uh, no, Bella's going to do her podcast. We will be right back with more of the Pope on Film. Maxwell, uh, why don't you uh, take us to the break? You're really good at this, okay? okay. Oh, you got to stand up for this? Okay. Yeah. Sure. You ready? Yeah. Come come yeah. here. Come here. They have to be able to hear you, so come here. We'll be right back with more of the Pope on Film after these commercial mentions. You did the do that. Yes, you do have a team. We're all very proud of you and your TM. Yeah. An ass put on a lion skin and went bouncing around the forest merrily, scaring the foolish beasts by brooks and by rocks. Till at last, he tried to scare Bob. But Bob, hearing from beneath the main, that raucous voice, so petulant, so vain. Oh, ass, Bob too will run away. But that Bob knows your old familiar prey. That's just the way with asses. That's just. Everybody stinks. I'm Peter Fonda. We've just finished making a movie dealing with the most talked about subject of the day, LSD. I honestly believe it will be today's most talked about motion picture. The name of the picture is The Trip. Here goes. cloud of light that just flows right out of the city. Beauty you cannot believe inundates you. Your world, the people world, is fragmented. Distorted. is a rainbow of ecstasy. The messenger 
dangers of death pursue. Terrify you. I'm gonna die, man. Oh, no. Oh, I'm not. Right. I don't want to die. If that happens to you again, you go ahead and go with it. Just go ahead and die. Whatever happens. The wildest of pleasures possess you. Blow your mind. And we're back with more of the Popon film. Really happy that I started the and we're back with more of the Pope on film loud enough to cover Bella threatening to squish Maxwell's face. <laughs> That was uh, well timed by me. Now no one knows. No. Well then, Bunny. Yes. Let's talk. Let's talk about books. You see, people <laughs> always say, "Hey, do you work here?" To which I say, "Yes, I do work here. How can I help you?" To which they say, "Oh no, I, I'm." I'm just looking for a book. Never mind. To which I say, oh, no, ma'am, I do. I do work here. What can I help you with? To which they say, oh, no, young man, I need someone who knows kids books. So I'll just find a young woman to help me. To which I interrupt with, oh, no, that's still me. <laughs> I know kids books better than anyone here in the store. What can I help you find? To which they say, oh, nothing. Uh, they say nothing is what they say. And they stutter and panic because <laughs> they are a 69-year-old MAGA grandmother from Kent, Ohio. And I'm a long-haired minority with a very small amount of power. <laughs> so so they stutter and panic. And the pa their panicked tone continues until I finally calm it down with, you see... I have five kids at home. And now the customer warms up. Now the customer is excited. Now the customer is ready to ask me a question. Why? Because, because my five kids plays into their inherent racist stereotypes. And yes. the question they ask is, are you Catholic? Oh, oh, no, no, no. He, see, he knows kids books so well. Because he has so many kids. And he has so many kids. See, a lot of his people have a lot of kids. <laughs> because they're Catholic. Well, you, know, you know, a lot of a lot of your people have a lot of uh, have so many kids. Because okay. they're Catholic. Yeah. Oh, so I'm looking for Junie B. Jones books. So do you have any of those? And so I take them to the section where we have the Junie B. Jones books. And then I go into my receiving department put on an Adam Warrock song, and just cry. Because <laughs> it hurts. It hurts, buddy. I, I, I understand. I completely it understand. It hurts you, but they can still hurt you. Yeah. People also say, hey, write what you know. And what I know is that after 17 plus years of working at a bookstore, people do not know the difference between Bible translations. <laughs> people do not know the difference between Bible translation. Or uh, uh, you got any Bibles? <laughs> yeah, we we've got a we've got a big Bible section over here. Is there any specific one you're looking for? Oh, I'm I'm just looking for a Bible. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was just wondering about translation. You know, we've got, uh, you know, the, the King James, the New King James, the New International Version, the New Living Translation, the English Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version. Well, look, 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 I'm just looking for, uh, for, for like, a good, good-sized Bible with, uh... <laughs> it's got to have a, some heft to it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. You know, you know, one of the, one of them Bibles with uh, where the word of God is like in red. And I'm like, okay, well, you just described 90 percent of all Bibles. So uh, we're whittling it down little by little. It's, it's the thing that upsets me is that um, as a Christian, your entire belief system, your entire belief, uh, your all of your beliefs. Your entire uh, belief system mm-hmm. is based on this one book. <laughs> so you would think that you would get to know the book. You would think <laughs> you would know the t- different types of translations and uh, where the book originated and the history and the things that were in the book that were cut out. But no, no, no clue at all. That's why the, the every week. All of the Bibles are are carefully um, shrink wrapped with plastic, and you find them all over the store because no one knows the difference between Bibles. So I just have to unwrap each one and look and see. It's like a, I want a candy and I want just like a good chocolate. So I'm at the supermarket. I better open up all of these candy bars. <laughs> Just to make sure I get, like, I just want a good chocolate one with a good creamy center. It, it, <laughs> is that a Snickers? I don't know. I better open it up and check. It's just, it, anyway, it upsets me. Yeah. What I also know, what are you looking for, Maxwell? What sign? <laughs> what? Oh, you made me drop you made me spill this drink get get me get me a paper towel get me a paper towel you're my paper towel person because you made me drop this get me a paper towel please oh i dropped it on my tie man okay thank you but get me more than one square i appreciate you trying to save paper towels i guess i, I don't know are we in a recession but <laughs> if you could give me more than one square I would appreciate that. Okay. Give me three squares. That's a little bit better. Thank you, Maxwell, for getting me paper towels. And now this is wet, but that's fine. We'll just look past that. So <laughs> I don't know where the sign is, Maxwell. I don't know where the sign is that was on your toy. Anyway, what I know, what I also know is that I have been a loyal and viciously scatterbrained employee at my local bookstore for over 17 years now. Wow! 17 years. Yes. That is a long time. If my bookselling career were a person, then it would be too old for Judge Roy Moore. (laughs) Oh, 17, slow down there. Yeah, we don't want to be getting all carried away. Yeah. Oh, you're a grandma. <laughs> and you know, Bunny. Yes. If I could have one wish this holiday season, it would be for all the children of the world to join hands and sing a song of harmony and peace. And you know, Bunny, if I could have two wishes this holiday season, the first, of course, would be for all the children of the world to join hands and sing in a song of harmony and peace. Yes. And the second wish would be for Roy Moore to spend the rest of his life rotting in a prison where numerous gangs of varying ethnicities took turns beating and or raping him. Yeah. A lot of people wish that, I think. Hmm? A lot of people wish that, but I, I still can't get over the people who are like anybody except a Democrat. Yeah. And you can't help be like, what the serious fuck is wrong with you? We're yeah. talking about a fucking pedophile here. Yeah. You know, I mean, and- we're not we're not talking about Rob Lowe's sex tape, you know? Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And uh, Rob Lowe is amazing because because 
people nowadays say, Oh my goodness, I'm a Kardashian. My sex tape was leaked. Oh man, I hate that. Yeah. Don't question don't question uh uh that that this sex tape, which was totally leaked, has been published by a major uh uh porn studio uh and it's amazingly well lit. <laughs> uh, the cover has my face on it. Oh no, my sex tape got leaked. Don't question where the money, where the where the proceeds for this tape is going. Just pity me because my sex tape was leaked. <laughs> Rob Lowe literally had it leaked. Yes. <laughs> like literally had this leaked back when that wasn't just a a fake statement to say. Yeah. So Yeah, he, he certainly did and he he got out of it yeah yeah if if, if, the thing that pissed me off is that so many of roy moore's uh, supporters were like oh well these these attacks are unsubstantiated there's no truth to these rumors but here's a bit of truth that you can uh, find out yourself uh a christian company did a documentary about judge roy moore um back when he was uh saying no to uh christian to to gay marriage and in this video that christians made he was talking about meeting his uh beloved his lovely wife and in the documentary he does say that oh i remember the the first day i met my wife she was across the room at a party and i just saw her and she was just the most beautiful woman i ever saw and i went to one of the party guests and i said what is her name and they said her name and i said oh I'm going to remember that name because that woman is just beautiful. She just took my breath away. <laughs> eight years later, eight years later, uh, we were introduced to each other again. And I remembered her from that party. And I said, I saw you at a party eight years ago and we just hit it off. And a year later, we were married. <laughs> that was basically a story that Roy Moore said in a documentary about his life. Now, if you go to Google, if you if you if you Google him, if you Wikipedia him, uh, it's public record that Roy Moore's wife is actually half of Roy Moore's age. And if you do the math, uh, they got married when uh, Roy Moore's wife was only twenty two years old. Of of course. So if you do the math on that, if you do the math on that, yeah, they got married a year after they were dating, and then Roy Moore saw her at a party eight years before that. Mm-hmm. Gives you, a, you know, you could do the math there on 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 your own as to when Roy Moore first saw his wife. <laughs> yeah. That's a Christian fact, right there. Well, wait a second. Christian and fact. I know. There are some problems there. Yeah. There are some problems right there. Also, just to be clear, this opening isn't super long because I don't have a lot planned. This opening is super long because it's funny as hell. And because I don't have a lot planned. (laughs) Cool. It's not because I don't have a lot planned first. Yeah. It's first because it's funny as hell, and secondly because I don't have a lot planned. And as such, I really do have my fingers on the pulse of the book world, and I am here to rub my fingers all over your chests. Um, uh, not literally, figuratively. With this week's painfully awkward installment of Notes from the Bookstore! <laughs> Bunny, yes. this pa- this past week has been hell on earth for me. What hell has gone on? on? Is it just the whole Christmas season thing? or I'm getting a crazy amount of books. I am getting a crazy amount of stuff. I'm still getting 120, 140, 180 uh, boxes a day. The only difference is is that we are getting so busy, so ridiculously busy, even on like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that they are just, I am spending two times more 
time on the floor as a bookseller helping customers than I was last year. Last really? year, I'm spending most of my time just in the back listening to my weird music and doing my job. But this year, we're just a little bit more short staffed. And so they need me on the floor and I'm spending so much time on the floor. And so I'm not getting a lot done in receiving. And it's it's I, I am not looking forward to the next two days because the next two days are going to be so ridiculously busy. And yet tomorrow which will be the last delivery day before Christmas, uh, I'm scheduled to get about 180 boxes. Mm. I don't know what I'm going to do with those 180 boxes because we'll be so busy. There's no way I'll be able to. I'm going to have like the smallest amount of time to actually receive any of those boxes. I'll be spending most of my time on the floor. Yeah. So, so yeah, not looking forward to that. It's just, it's been very difficult. It has been very difficult. I, I don't have any help right now. It's basically just me receiving everything and trying to get it all onto the floor. Mm-hmm. And it's just I've been at my wits end. I've been drinking a lot more energy drinks and just trying to stay wired. And also last year, we canceled the last story time before Christmas. The reason is because um, Black Friday is known as like the busiest shopping day, but it's the busiest shopping day in terms of um, – foot traffic yeah the busiest shopping day in terms of uh money spent is always the 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 friday and saturday before christmas and this is going to be especially more busy this weekend because christmas is on a monday so so that just brings an extra amount of pressure to it yeah and so this saturday is literally just going to be a bomb dropping hell on earth and, and yet, uh, the corporate uh, head honchos, they didn't cancel story time. So it's going to be the busiest shopping day in the history of ever. And I have to read a book about Santa's magic key. So I'm really excited. <laughs> really excited about that. Apparently, it, it, if the way Santa gets into your house, if you don't have a chimney, is Santa has a magic key. And what I but what I tell kids is first thing Santa checks for a chimney. Yeah. If you don't have a chimney, Chan, Santa checks for an open window. If if you don't have an open window, Santa checks for a security system mm-hmm. <laughs> to see if there are any windows he can sort of jimmy open. If that doesn't work, Santa will build you a chimney. <laughs> Then go down the chimney, leave the presents, then go up the chimney, and then destroy the chimney. (laughs) And if all of that doesn't work, he has a magic key, and that's what the story's going to be about. Yeah. So excited about that. (laughs) That's. I don't know how I'm going to do this story time when we're going to be ridiculously, like, kids, I don't know how you're going to get here. You might have to, you might have to park in Dallas, Texas and walk. Yeah. To our that, store. That sounds like a big possibility. Yeah, that might be the only possibility. So so that's enough of how much work sucks. This week bunny. This week. Very excited about this. I have for you. Uh-huh. What? What? What do I have? I, what do I, I have? Bunny? I, I, I don't herpes. Let me tell you what I have. What I have. I have an opportunity. Uh huh. Once in a lifetime opportunity for you, Bunny, for you <laughs> to get on the ground floor. Okay. Exciting. Can't fail business opportunity, okay? All right. This is a must invest opportunity that you cannot afford to miss. Oh, 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 what is this? What is this? What is it? Let me tell you what <laughs> what this is. This is uh, getting Apple stock when it was a dollar a share. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, some guy saying, I've just invented a phone that's smart. A smart phone. Yes. This is the freaking clapper. <laughs> This is some crazy guy saying, hey, I I know this is weird, but I made this statue, and if you shove these seeds into it and water it, 
It's like Garfield is growing grass hair. I call it a chia pet. <laughs> Do you think people would want to buy this for, say, the next 50 decades? Yeah. Clap on, clap off the clapper. <clears throat> so, Bunny, let me tell you my amazing super boffo idea. Yeah. What? Is the single hottest musical of the last 10 years, Bunny? No, not the SpongeBob SquarePants musical currently playing on Broadway. <laughs> well, Jeannie well, had said, said Les Miserables. The last 10 years, that was a while, that was like 80s. There were Seinfeld episodes about Les Miserables. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the Master of the House episode. No, I'm talking about of the last 10 years. But no, I want to pause this and talk about the SpongeBob SquarePants musical currently playing on Broadway. Okay. Because surprisingly, people are giving it wonderful reviews. Really? That, Actually is, that heard, is surprising. I am surprised. I, they interviewed the the show head, the head of the show, the the the, the musicals creator Puba. on PR Saturday, and there's this old guy who does NPR uh, uh, morning news on Saturday, and uh, I consider this like the greatest review. The old guy was basically like, "I've I've I've got to tell you, after watching this uh, musical of yours." I really love SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> like a, for like a sixty-year-old man to say that, like, okay, this has to be a wonderful musical. Yeah. But here's the thing that gets me about the SpongeBob SquarePants musical. Okay, here's the thing that gets me. This is a really weird musical, and the sets are really bizarre. And the person who they got to be the showrunner for the SpongeBob SquarePants musical originally said no to Nickelodeon because she said. I'm not going to make some musical where there's people in giant foam heads. I'm just not doing that. <laughs> so what they actually have is like a very minimalist, realist take on on the SpongeBob characters. So like uh, the guy who's playing Patrick Starr isn't some guy in a big giant Patrick outfit. He's just a fat guy in pink. <laughs> okay. And so SpongeBob is just some like hyperactive, vaguely gay-seeming young man with a high voice in pants and a suit with a, a shirt with a tie. You know, it, it's a very minimalist approach, and it, they had some interview with one of the cast members where they weren't sure if people were going to really take to these characters, but then after the first preview, they heard one of the kids talking to their mom as they left the theater, and the kid said to the mom, Mommy, I'm so glad I got to see what SpongeBob looks like in real life. Oh, no. They're like, okay, that's adorable. That's kind of adorable. And um, they I, they actually performed at this year's um, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And I'm like, oh, my God, this looks horrible. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine that anyone would want to see this. And then we got the, 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 the like, the, the, the cast album. We got yeah. it at work, you know. And here's. Here's the thing. I'm pretty sure this is a first ever, okay? Yeah. I'm pretty sure this is a first ever. All of the music for the SpongeBob SquarePants musical has been written by a number of famous people. You had mentioned this before. I've never seen this before. Here are some of the people who wrote uh, music for the SpongeBob musical. They might be giants. Brian E. Eno... Jonathan Colton, Aerosmith, Plain White Tees, Cindy Lauper, The Flaming Lips, and David Bowie right before he freaking died. I'm, I'm, number... I'm not buying Aerosmith. I'm not buying that. Aerosmith well, doesn't no, even no. write songs for fucking Aerosmith anymore. Mm. Let, me, let me explain that. I actually wasn't sure if I was going to say Aerosmith. But the but the song was written by Steven Tyler and Joe Perry. Yeah. And in my mind, that's basically Aerosmith. Yeah. Like, no one's like, oh, Aerosmith. I love that drummer. Uh, I believe his name is Fat Guy, who is the drummer from Aerosmith. <laughs> yes. Like, no one, no one is. So basically, Joe Perry, Steven Tyler. Okay, that's Aerosmith. 
So I just said Aerosmith, but Joe Perry and Steven Tyler wrote the song. But the thing is, is that I can't think, and I've been asking some people I know who know theater, have there been any other musicals out there where the music were, each individual song was written by a different famous person or famous group and all they can say is that um there are jukebox musicals out there and there are jukebox musicals like uh rock of ages which have different songs that have been written by different famous people but those are songs that already existed these are songs that were written specifically for the spongebob musical yeah they went to David Bowie and said, okay, it's act two and a volcano is about to explode. We need a song for Patrick to sing and take <laughs> it away, David Bowie, on his deathbed. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is historical. Whether we want it to be or not, I'm pretty sure this is a historic musical. Well, you could say that about just about everything these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's historical. <laughs> yeah. but no the um what's the question um uh the question on hand is the the most what what is the single hottest musical of the last 10 years and of course the answer is hamilton yes the story of one of our nation's founders but told by an all black all minority cast smash hit massive success hamilton I dare say, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, hell, five freaking years ago, I dare uh, I dare say that the majority of Americans didn't know jack shite about Alexander Hamilton. Uh, I did, and I still think he was a douchebag, so... Yeah, but, yeah. like, I don't... But, but it's different now. People are more aware of Alexander Hamilton now than they were before. Oh, yeah. You know... But that's the power and the popularity of this musical. It changed our nation's concept of history, and it's amazing. Now, Bunny. Yes. At this juncture, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with notes from the bookstore? But stick with me here, because I'm just about to get to it, okay? All right. You see, Bun Dependence Day, the musical Hamilton was written by Mr. Lynn manuel Miranda. He wrote Hamilton after the success of his first Broadway play, In the Heights. In the Heights, very successful, won a number of Tonys. Best musical, um, uh, won a number of Tonys, or, or as I call them, Anthonys. Yes. Because I don't know the awards that well, so I'm not going to use the informal nickname of Tony. That's that's a that's a, a a prudent choice. In the Heights, Lin Manuel Miranda's first musical won a number of Anthony's, but uh, you gotta realize writing a Broadway play and then performing it and then getting it to Broadway and then doing it there for a year or two and then taking it out on tour. Not to mention writing a, a musical from scratch. That just takes so much time that's six or seven or eight whole years of your life that are mm -hmm. just absolutely gone you know yeah so after uh uh in the heights lin-manuel miranda he has no idea what he's going to do next so he he goes to the beach he he takes a vacation with his family and he takes with him a bit of light beach reading but this is MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, Tony Award winning uh, genius, Mr. Lin Manuel Miranda. So for Lin Manuel Miranda, apparently, light beach reading, with finger quotes, is the super long and incredibly dry nonfiction book Alexander Hamilton by Pulitzer Prize winning historian and author Ron Chernow. <laughs> So, to summarize, Lin-Manuel Miranda got a big, bland, boring Ron Chernow book and turned it into a culturally redefining musical sensation. Yes. So, so, Ron Chernow has a brand new book out. Yeah. It, it just came out. It's a biography about Ulysses S. Grant that's somehow even longer than his book on Alexander Hamilton. Here's my pitch. We write the musical now. I think so. I think we, we should get on it. Immediately start writing a musical about Ron Chernow's book, Ulysses S. Grant. I want to call it 
Grant exclamation point jazz hands is what I want to call it. <laughs> I, I like it. I like it a lot. Because we, we've already seen that someone, that a minority with the last name Miranda, uh, it, we've already seen that it's possible for a minority to get a long, boring Ron Chernow book about a historical figure and turn it into a musical. So we need to get this brand new Ron Chernow book. It doesn't even matter who it's about. We need to write the musical now. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I'll have you know that for the past two weeks, I've been working on it. You have? Good. Yes, my brand new musical, Grant! Exclamation point jazz hands. <laughs> now, uh, there's a slight problem, just a tiny problem, a, a wee, uh, a, just the tiniest little bit of difficulty in the fact that I can't write music. However, I'm not letting that stop me from writing this musical. Good. Good. That is that is probably the most Woodian statement I've made of in 2017. <laughs> I'm not going to let the the fact that I have no talent or experience in this stop me from doing it. So I don't have musical ability, and I don't have a uh, songwriting experience, and I don't I just don't know how to write music. But one thing I do have is a lifetime love appreciation and respect for the musical genius that is Mr. Weird Al Yankovic. See, I was going to say chutzpah. Yeah, yeah, and, and chutzpah, yeah. and chutzpah. Yeah. Of Mr. Weird Al Yankovic. So this is what I'm doing. I'm getting popular Broadway show tunes and rewriting them to be about Ron Chernow's book about Ulysses S. Grant. I think I've, we've got a uh, huge I, hit. I, I think you're really on to something. Uh, the first one you might know from the musical Fame. I'm trying to get popular, popular musical numbers and turn them into being about Ulysses S. Grant. So this is the first one. It's from the musical Fame. It, it's going to be our title track. Also, it's it's also possibly important to note. I know nothing about Ulysses S. Grant. I haven't read the book. That 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 shouldn't matter. The book is like a freaking brick. Like if if you bought enough of Ron Chernow's new book about Grant, you could build a house with it. That's how huge this freaking book is. It's massive. It's <laughs> like it's it's like a it's like a a Galapagos turtle had sex with a phone book. <laughs> this new Ron Chernow book and I don't have time to read that so um, my songs for the Grant musical which again is entitled Grant exclamation point jazz hands yes you know it's not huge on facts but facts we are in a post fact age yeah yeah we can fix it in post mm -hmm. so so this is the, the title track. Really proud of it. Grant! I'm gonna win the Civil War! And my first name is Ulysses Grant! <laughs> my middle name is S! I didn't bother to look it up, look it up, look it up, look it up. <laughs> so that's the title track. I'm also working on kind of a different one. This is a really sad song that happens during a Civil War battle. Yeah. It, except uh, it, it, I try and... I, 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 I've picked a popular song to try and... A happy song to try and make it l of a less depressing battle. So, yeah. so this is uh, from Oklahoma. <laughs> Okay. It, 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 the wording isn't perfect, but I'm working on it. Gettysburg, where the wind comes sweeping from the corpses. <laughs> I've got so far on that one, but it's a work in progress. We're working on it. There's another well, you, you one. Need a, you need a good couple of up tunes. You know. Yeah. Speaking of up tunes, there's another song that I have. 
Eleanor is crying with happiness over my songs. Good. That's she nice. heard me singing my songs, and she's like, oh, these are great. I'm crying because these songs are so good. There's another Up song that I have, and it's um, it's Ulysses S. Grant, and it's Robert E. Lee, and they're on opposite sides of the stage. Oh, talking to their soldiers about the last battle that they had. That 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 and, that's that's gripping. Yeah, gripping. and so 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 they're talking to the soldiers about the the last big battle, and so it's it's sort of like a Civil War days drifting away to uh oh those Civil War nights. <laughs> Then all the soldiers are like, oh, well, oh, well, oh, well, uh huh. You know? <laughs> tell me more, tell me more. Did you kill any slaves? So, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a kind of a happy thing because you need Robert E. Lee in there if this is going to be a musical about Ulysses S. Grant. You need Robert E. Lee. You, it, need, you need everybody who was uh, part of the chess set. Yeah. From the Franklin yeah. Mint. Yeah. 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 So, so I thought that those three would be good for my pitch, but then Natasha said, if you're getting songs from popular musicals, you need one from Rent. Yeah. Which, which I agreed to, but then I'm like, okay, I think I saw Rent once, and I don't remember shit. <laughs> what was Rent even about, about these... Uh, the only thing that I can think of when when someone says rent, all I can think of is a uh, uh, Team America. Yeah. <laughs> so, AIDS. So yeah. So what I'm working on is uh, what, what do you want me to do? Untie your shoe? Okay, I heard tie my shoe, but then I got confused because it was already tied. And uh, you've got like a like a four knot. You have like a four knotter on this one. It's quite impressive. You've got like four bows. It's it, it, nice work. Thank it's you. Nice work. <laughs> the entire other one. Okay. Well, it's not a one fur, but two fur. Uh, well, you said uh, untie my shoe. I didn't hear untie my shoes, <laughs> so I wasn't sure. <laughs> he could be the next Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Double the flavor. There you are. So, so my uh, fourth song from my Grant musical, yeah, comes from Rent, and it comes from, as far as I re- recall, the only, as far as I can recall, this is the only song in all of Rent. <laughs> okay. Anybody thinks it's worth a damn? Yeah, the only one anyone thinks is worth a damn. Uh, five hundred twenty-five thousand six hundred soldiers. That's how many people may have died in the Civil War. Because again, I don't know know the facts about the Civil War, but I'm not letting that stop me from writing the Civil War musical. And and I really don't think you should. I don't see the reason why you would. Yeah, because it's not about the facts. No. It's writing this musical now before Lin-Manuel Miranda gets bored again. (laughs) And goes to the fucking beach. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to write this musical now and claim the rights to it before Lin Man- Lin Manuel Miranda gets bored and goes to the bookstore again. Mm-hmm. So be sure and look for my new musical entitled "Grant!" Exclamation point! Jazz hands. It's going to be coming <laughs> to Broadway soon, and then we do the book, and then we do the movie rights, and yeah. then suddenly everyone's going to be taught. Then that's how I get on Drunk History. You know what we do, okay? Stay with me here, all right? Just like SpongeBob SquarePants, okay? Mm-hmm. We'll get a bunch of different writers each to write a line. Ooh, that's a good one. We'll get like Stephen King and J.K. Rowling, and that's all I know. I don't work in a bookstore. So, so all of the, so all of the lines, 
of the play, like here's the scene where Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee are meeting at the Appomattox Courthouse. And Ulysses S. Grant walks up to Robert E. Lee and says, how did you get this number? (laughs) And then Robert E. Lee goes, stop emailing me. (laughs) And yeah, ooh, that line was from J.K. Rowling. Yeah. That stop emailing me. And then Ulysses S. Grant slams his fist on the table and says, you have been blocked on Twitter. <laughs> then they go into a song. It, this is all coming along great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wait until you get the restraining order. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll wait until <laughs> I get the restraining order. And that from is who? From who? Grant, he's dead. Uh, Stephen King. No, Stephen King wouldn't restrain order of you. That didn't come out right. No, he's going to write a line for us. Yeah, in the form of a restraining order. (laughs) Um, We can work it in somewhere. (laughs) Stephen King is really going to help me out, but that's only because I I have eight balls. (laughs) I'm pretty sure I can get him. I'm pretty sure I can get him. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's that was his going price. <laughs> yeah, that was that's that's how that's how we got uh, Emilio Estevez in Maximum Overdrive. <laughs> oh, that was great. God, <laughs> I love that stupid movie so much. Sorry. And that is it from note from the bookstore this week. We're keeping it light because working retail during Christmas makes you seriously debate cobaining yourself. Yes. And remember, boys and girls and gender wild cards, you too can save 10% on all of your purchases. And all you have to do is please buy some of our clearance items. I have about 40 boxes in receiving of clearance items that I don't have the room to put on the floor because no one's buying clearance items. Please! (laughs) Buy some clearance stuff. It's been... I know it's been 50% off for the last three and a half months, but I swear it'll be going 75% off one of these years. Yes. So please, (laughs) buy some of our clearance items, please. Then we'll give you 10% off of all of your purchases of $3,000 or more. (laughs) And cut. Cut on that. And How you doing? Cut. How you doing, honey? You doing good? Uh I'm doing I'm doing better now that I know I can here. Yes. Do you want me to open one up for you? No, I want a a wrap to my knee. You no, are... no, I want an ace bandage wrap. Damn it! I was gonna I was Well my name's Steve and I'm here to say <laughs> Me it sucks in a major way. <laughs> or I was gonna go all M M&M M with it. Me, you're a gay bitch. I'm gonna choke you, bitch, gay bitch, fag bitch, bitch. That's an Eminem rap. And then here's the point where Rihanna starts singing, and that's the <laughs> part that people remember. And then, like Eminem's the weak part of all of Eminem songs. That's fair. Like people don't remember Eminem's song "Monster" from the part. I'm an underdog. Watch me fight the system. You know. That's not what people are singing when they're singing Eminem's monster. I'm singing in my... Yeah, yeah. Hey, Bunny. Hey! Guess what? What? No, you have to guess. You have to actually guess. Uh... 42! You're not funny. The Constellation Orion. Wow, you are close, Bunny. You're like really, really close. Like that's impressive. Like, like kudos to you. Hats off to you. Golf clap. <laughs> you're like super close to what I was about to say. Okay, well, you're not that close. You're you're like a bit close, maybe. Yeah. Or or like a smidgen close. You're a smidgen close. <laughs> well, no, no. Now that I'm looking, no, actually, you're a bit far. Yeah, you're a bit you're 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 a little bit far from what I was going to say. You're quite far, actually. Now that I'm sort of stepping back 
from your answer and like looking at the big picture. Oh my god, Bunny, you are so off. <laughs> you were like ridiculously off. You were amazingly off. Like how even did you do that? How were <laughs> you so far off the mark, Bunny? You were like so gone. You are so out there. Like are you <laughs> like are you like are you all right, Bunny? Like is there something wrong? That you're not telling me? Or like, oh no, oh no, oh Bunny, I I know I, okay, I get it, Bunny. I can read between the lines here. You're dying, aren't you, Bunny? Um, you. Well, in a, in a Sylvia Plath kind of way, aren't we all? What? What have you been hiding from me, Bunny? What is it? Is it cancer of the cervix of the avian flu of the AIDS? Is that <laughs> what you have? You have plague of the AIDS of the cancer of the cervix. Is uh, is that it, Bunny? When were you going to tell me, Bunny? I deserve to know the truth. Well, I was waiting for your birthday. You know. You know what? I'm sorry, Bunny. I'm sorry to have lashed out at you like that. I didn't mean to lash out. Look, Bunny. You and me. You and me, Bunny. We we <laughs> will get through this together. Okay. Yeah. Because I here for you and we are going to fight this and you are going to beat this you are going to beat this to you and i we're going to get through this together don't you die on me soldier don't you die on me don't you die on me anyway it's homework time once again yes on old pulp on film podcast <clears throat> People of the internet, your attention, please. Cease your food Instagramming and kindly pay attention! Each week, the dreaded Council of Maxwells descends from their silvery floating citadel in the sky and picks out a homework assignment via the fiery ritual of carousel. <laughs> a homework assignment that is picked with the express purpose of bettering our listeners. Nay, all secret lizard people everywhere. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, but not you, Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Shame on you. What's the point of being a secret Illuminati lizard person if you're going to lose the election? <laughs> That's it the whole is, point. It's a damn good point. Like, if she's... A secret Illuminati Freemason lizard person, child molesting pedophile billionaire Satanist, then how did she lose? <laughs> like, she was everything. I believe she was a member of Cobra. <laughs> I she think so. She wasn't just a member of Cobra, she was also a member of uh, Jobra. Jobra. Which which was the community the G.I. Joe Cobra hybrid. <laughs> a preview just dropped today, Bunny, for uh, the Netflix movie uh, uh, a, a, a Stupid and uh, a Pointless and Futile Gesture, I believe is what it's called. Okay. It's uh, David Wayne's new film. He did Wet Hot American Summer. And it's a biopic about the the his the making of and the history of National Lampoon. Okay. As a, as a magazine just created by two guys that wasn't selling really well. And then it became popular and it became a cold hit. And then suddenly they're working on making a movie and they're doing cocaine and the Saturday Night Live people are there. And and so like it's a movie of the history of the National Lampoon. And also a history of Saturday Night Live and a history of the making of uh, uh, Animal Animal House and yeah. Caddyshack. And so all of these famous people are in it. And so you see um, what's the name? John Belushi and Bill Murray. And the, the main reason why I'm excited about this is that Chevy Chase yeah. is paid by Joel McHale. I don't know Joe McHale. He played um, uh, Jeff Winger, the star of Community. Oh, okay. And he was in Community for like five or six seasons with Chevy Chase. Yes. That's why I'm excited about this. That, that, yeah, that could be interesting. 
they've picked like the perfect person to play Chevy Chase. And also you got to realize that this is like 1977, 78, 79, 80, 81. So we're talking famous, sexy Chevy Chase back when he <laughs> realized, like, holy shit, I'm famous and people think I'm attractive. Well, all right, then I'm going to be a dick for the rest of my life. Like, uh, Joel McHale is perfect for young, sexy Chevy Chase. Back when he still <laughs> thought, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be huge. I'm going to be a leading man. My star will never fade. Yeah. I'm really excited. The preview just came out, like, a few hours ago. It's a Netflix movie. And uh, a bunch of really famous people are in it, and uh, I'm really excited. You should see that preview. It's really good. I, I've seen it, like, three times already today. It's really, really good. Cool. So, uh, where was I? Oh, yes. This week, we are talking, um, we are talking about, oh, uh, about some of my favorite topics. Pizza, the 1980s, Atari games, CeeLo Green, and creepy-ass animatronics. <laughs> yes. Yay! So this week, our homework assignment is a lengthy, detailed article, possibly too lengthy and detailed. Yes. From Vice, entitled, A History of Chuck E. Cheese's Animatronic Band. <laughs> mm. mm-hmm. Taking a big swing of, swig of my drink for this. Um, Maxwell, my son, loves Chuck E. Cheese to yeah. death. We do not go a lot. The last time I went was for my uh, nephew Jaden's birthday. And it's funny because it was like two years ago, I think. And um, I was there and Maxwell was all excited and Jaden was all excited. But then you look around and there's Bella and there's Emerald and there, there's Amber. And they're all looking really nervous. And I'm like, why are you looking nervous? And And it's because... It's it, they're just staring at this robot animatronic band going. Oh, my God. Five Nights at Freddy's has ruined me. <laughs> and I'm, oh, so you're picturing these robots coming to life and strangling you and, and uh, shoving your dead corpse into a suit. And then the suit comes to life every night and plays. So you're imagining that these audio animatronic robots are actually filled inside with the bodies of dead children. Yeah. It's dead. Dad, you're not fucking helping. <laughs> but Maxwell loves Chuck E. Cheese, and um, uh, they're getting rid of the robot bands at all yeah. of the Chuck E. Cheese's. And so I, I, and this article is just remarkably long, like way too long. We're talking about the history of the Chuck E. Cheese robot band. This article does not have to be that long. No. Have you ever but, been to but, a? But we but we learned a lot. I think. Mm-hmm. No, I have never been to a Chuck E. Cheese. What? I have, I have never. I I don't have children. It's never come up. <laughs> if you go to if you go to Chuck E. Cheese alone, people are going to want to talk to you. They do have alcohol, though. Do they? Yes, they do. <laughs> You know, just one day, just you and me, let's just go to Chuck E. Cheese and get fucking wasted off our ass. <laughs> that I would be down for. And they're like, oh, we're banned from Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> hey, hey, Bunny, you want to go drink? Yeah, but not Chuck E. Cheese. They've got my picture up. <laughs> can't, go, can't go into the Chuck E. Cheese anymore. <laughs> this article helped me answer a few questions that I had growing up. Yeah, such as? Um, by my school, the Catholic school that I went from first to eighth grade at, right near there, there was a showbiz pizza. Yes. And Which I, I did to- not know existed until this article. Oh, I I love Showbiz Pizza because Showbiz Pizza had the Rock a Fire Explosion show, and, and and that was the gorilla and uh, the 
the drummer who was a surfer and there was a cheerleader who had pom poms and there was a a redneck guy in the side and there was a, a dog that had a Mary that had like a hand puppet and and it, it was really weird but the thing that I loved about showbiz pizza is that you would go to showbiz pizza and they'd have a routine and they'd be singing songs and most of them were popular songs and they'd be doing like covers of them and yeah. then in between that they'd be saying jokes and stuff and it was you know, some of the jokes were kind of funny and then like you'd leave and you'd come back like three weeks later or a, or a month later and the band would be doing something totally different yeah and i'm like oh wow i, I was just here three and a half weeks ago and it's a totally new routine you're not just seeing the same thing over and over again i specifically remember one joke that the rock of fire explosion show did yeah and it was um they they were talking in between uh, songs, and Fat said, "Hey guys, you, you guys should uh, check out my latest business venture." Oh, what's your business venture? Well, I started a one eight hundred number where people <laughs> can call me Fats personally. You can talk to me, and I can tell you jokes, and we can have just a fun time. Oh, really? What's the number? Oh, well, the number is 1-800-CALL-FATS. That's 1-800-C-A-L-L-F-A-T-Z. <laughs> and, then, and then the other band members are going, aren't you? Wait a second. Sh shouldn't it be F-A-T-S? Oh, you don't want to call F-A-T-S. That's not my number. You call F-A-T-S. You get some crazy person in the Philippines somewhere. No, it's F-A-T-Z. And I remember sitting there eating pizza and watching this and seeing three boys stand up and say, I'm going to run to the, the telephone it's outside and call Fats right now and running to the telephone. And then like <laughs> two three kids following that kid and they're all running outside of the showbiz pizza to be the first to get to the pay phone. But back in the day, pay phones never had a Z. Is that right? That yeah. might be right, yeah. And that was the joke, because the kids all come walking back like two minutes later going, there is no Z on the phone! <laughs> like, yeah, that was the joke. Like, it, like me always being the, like, level-headed, rational kid. Like, all the kids are like, I'm going to run to the phone and call right now! And they're all running. And then my mom's like, Stevie, do you want to go with them? No, there's no Z on the phone. <laughs> so uh, I believe that was the joke. That's why the surfer one was saying, isn't it F-A-T-S? Yeah, so, yeah, this is all a joke. It's very funny. <laughs> but I loved showbiz So, pizza. So you actually went to a Chuck E. Cheese at no, a Chuck E. So Cheese, a, well, showbiz, same fucking place. And the article proves it, I think. Uh, At an age appropriate stage in your life, yeah. Oh, my parents like they take they say, "Oh, we're gonna go to the doctor. We're gonna just give you a little checkup, just a tiny little checkup. Everything will be fine." I go to the doctor, and they're like, "Oh, uh, little Stevie here hasn't been to the doctor in quite some time. We need to give him five shots." <laughs> yeah. And they just shoot my arm up and I'm there crying. And my parents, my, when I say parents, I just mean mom. My dad never did anything. Yeah. So my mom would be like, Oh, Stevie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know they would do that here. Let me make it up to you. And we're at Showbiz Pizza. <laughs> and okay, the pizza. Cool. Good deal. The way that I remember the pizza is, um, I don't because the pizza didn't matter because there were giant robots singing Beatles songs to me. Yeah. And then in between their songs, there were arcade games. <laughs> so, like, I don't remember the pizza. It could have been made out of cardboard. It could have been made out of shit for all I care. But the important thing is the pizza didn't matter. But then... I got invited to a birthday party and it was at a Chuck E. Cheese in Scotts in Mesa, Arizona. And that was like 
40 minutes away, 45 minutes away and like super far. And, and, and I'm like, Chuck E. Cheese, what's that? And, and, uh, the kids are like, Oh, it's like showbiz pizza, but it's so much better. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't, but I don't. Okay. Let me see if my parents and I begged my parents to let me go. And we did. And we went to Chuck E. Cheese and it was a completely different place because there were these there were these picture frames on the wall and there would be creatures that were talking to you and telling jokes. Yeah. But then that was just one room. Then you would go to a different room and there was one room that had all of these dogs that were dressed like the Beatles <laughs> and they were singing show tunes. And then you went to these different uh, rooms that had different arcade games. And they, it was so weird and bizarre. It was a completely different thing. And I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, okay. I thought showbiz and, and, and Chuck E. Cheese were, were the same, but they were just completely different and so bizarre and weird. And, and I never went back to that Chuck E. Cheese. And so I, but I would go to the showbiz pizza all the time in the Rock of Fire Explosion show. And I love the Rock of Fire Explosion show. And, and so when I got older, yeah. like in like my my preteens, all of the Chuck E. Cheese's closed down and all of the showbiz pizzas closed down. And eventually they were all replaced with Chuck E. Cheese. So I always heard that these two companies were like fighting with each other. So I assumed that Chuck E. Cheese won in the lawsuit and took over. But no, apparently it was the other way around. Showbiz yeah. Pizza beat Chuck E. Cheese and then called all of them Chuck E. Cheese. Yes. <laughs> Look, I never thought that I would say this, but I had a bit of a hard time following the complicated political machinations <laughs> of the history of Chuck E. Cheese. Yes. And 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 I feel you're completely justified. Yeah. Now I did see the documentary on the Rock of Fire Explosion show. I think it was on YouTube or maybe Netflix. It was on Netflix. Yeah. It'd still be on Netflix. But I watched it and I watched it because I loved them growing up. They were actually fully realized characters and they would sing popular songs and 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 uh I would watch them growing up and I loved them. But then like after, they would do like maybe like a 10 minute set and then they would shut down for like 15 minutes and then they would come back on again after 50 minutes and do like a different set and always between the sets uh -huh. like the like uh, the the robots would turn off the lights would come off and curtains would come around the characters and there were always those kids who were who there was always that one boy who was brave enough to walk over there and peek under the curtain. Oh. And let me tell you, a, a few times I was that brave and it was the creepiest thing in the world. I think that's why um, I did not play Five Nights at Freddy's for a really long time. Bella was playing it and Emerald was playing it and Amber was playing it when it first came out. And it's like this super popular game. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not sure why, but um, this scares the shit out of me and I'm not going to play it. <laughs> Don't ask me why. I'm not 100% certain why myself. All I know is that I'm not playing Five Nights at Freddy's. Oh my god, but uh, Bella's coming out here. I, I told her so I'd be cool. calling on her for this because she is a Five Nights at Freddy's master, but I'm not at I Five mean, Nights at Freddy's yet. I keep mentioning Five Nights at Freddy's, but I'm not there yet. I'm just going to say, I was on the floor laying down. <laughs> yeah. I'm cold. <laughs> okay. So there were two bands. There was the Rock of Fire Explosion show, and that was at Showbiz Pizza. And then there was Munch's Make Believe Band. And yes. they were the Chuck E. Cheese version. And then this one guy who had this uh, uh, animatronics company, he created Munch's Make Believe Band for Chuck E. Cheese. And then, and as far as I can tell from the story, it's a bit complicated. But then this guy was like, okay, I'm going to buy Chuck E. Cheese. And then he's going to buy Chuck E. Cheese. But before he buys Chuck E. Cheese, he meets the guy who created Munch's Make Believe Band. And then next thing you know, instead of buying Chuck E. Cheese, he just says, 
screw you guys, I'm going to go with your audio animatronics guy, and we're going to make our own restaurant. It's going to be showbiz pizza, and I'm going to make sure, since I have the guy who made Chuck E. Cheese for you, I'm going to make sure it's better. So, hey, guy who created Chuck E. Cheese for the Chuck E. Cheese people, um, do the same thing, but better. So yeah. the Rock of Fire Explosion show was basically what he wanted to do with Munch's Make Believe Band, but better. And it was just this, it was a bigger, better thing. Yeah. And it's an interesting article, surprisingly fraught with conflict. Yes. Yes, very much so. And it would make a pretty good movie. And I loved the Rock of Fire Explosion show. And then uh, a Showbiz Pizza left. And so when Chuck E. Cheese took over, I'm like, I'm never going back on Chuck E. Cheese. I'm so pissed at this. I hate Chuck E. Cheese. But then I got <laughs> older and I, I'm like in my, I'm like 19 years old, 20 years old, and I'm dating uh, Sarah Snow. And it, it's her birthday and I want to do something special, something she wouldn't expect. And so I blindfold her and I drive her around for a while just to pretend like I'm going someplace really far. But uh -huh. instead, I gave her a birthday at Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> okay. She's like a teenager and there's no reason for her to be there. So I just thought it was a bit ridiculous that there's all these tiny little kids and then suddenly us. <laughs> yes. And so we're there at Chuck E. Cheese, and I'm like, uh, she's like, oh, my God, there's a band. Yeah, it's Munch's Make Believe Band. They're crap. Let me tell you what was wonderful. <laughs> the Rock the Fire Explosion show. Wait a second. What the hell's happening? And so uh, when, I, when I finally went to Chuck E. Cheese at the literal location where the Rock of Fire Explosion show was, mm -hmm. um, in between Munch's Make Believe Band playing, TVs would appear, and you know what they would play in between the sets of uh, the Chuck E. Cheese band? What? You know? Veggie Tales! No! Veggie Tales! Yeah, the Christian talking, singing vegetable that cartoon. Was Christian? Yeah, it was Christian. <laughs> Was secretly Christian. You didn't know Veggie Tales was Christian? Oh no. hell yeah! They would do Bible stories. There oh was like Noah, God. like the story of Noah and stuff. You didn't know that? No. They what? would end every video with like a uh, uh, smile and remember Jesus loves you. No. <laughs> Can't believe you didn't know that was Christian. Holy <laughs> shit! Emerald had the same reaction when we told her when we told her recently. Like, oh wait a second. You didn't know that the private school you went to was Christian? And she's like, what? It was Christian? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, didn't you wonder why you went to freaking church at school? I mean, half of this might be our fault, that but the other half is life. also your fault. <laughs> but yeah, they would play like Christian cartoons in between. So then when I got older... And now I have my own kids, and they want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. I'm like, I don't know if we should go to Chuck E. Cheese. I mean, I know they want to go, but, like, last time I went there, they're playing, like, Veggie Tales and, like, Christian propaganda. I don't know what the hell's going on with Chuck E. Cheese anymore. I still miss the Rock of Fire Explosion show, and I'm a bit bitter about it. <laughs> so we went to Chuck E. Cheese, and it, in between... Uh, sets of Munch's Make Believe Band, they're playing like music videos and like cartoons and stuff. And one of the music videos shocked me because um, I'm like, it, 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 it was a really good song and it was really catchy. And we heard the song maybe like four or five times while we were there at the Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. And it's a really good song called I'm, uh, uh, I am thinking about something. I am thinking about something other than you. And it's a really good song, and then and then a uh, Weird Al Yankovic's in the video, and it's basically uh, a band doing like one of the first musical numbers from uh, the Blues Brothers. What's the name of the blind guy? Um, Ray Charles. Ray Charles. Ray Charles is number from the Blues Brothers, except it's in this music video. And then it took me a long time to real and Weird Al Yankovic's in the video, and I'm like, oh, he must have directed the video. And then finally, after like the third or fourth time, I'm like, holy shit, hey, honey, you see this video here they keep playing? That's fucking Hanson. <laughs> she looks at the video, and she's like, that can't be Hanson. When they did M-Bop, they were like 
10 years old. And I'm like, yeah, and that was like 15 years ago. That was like 15, 20 years ago. Now they're older and apparently talented. So uh, <laughs> I'm not proud of the fact that I have a Hanson song on my phone. But look, Weird Al Yankovic recorded the music video, and it's a damn good song. Yes. In fact, a radio station in uh, L.A. would play the song all the time on the radio station. But what they their gimmick was, we're going to play this song. We love this song. It's a really good song. It just came out. It's catchy. We're going to be playing it for a week until we tell you who it is. Okay. And good, they played good it plan, I think. Yeah, they played it for a week until they finally said, okay, now this is Hanson. And finally people are like, oh, okay. No, this is pretty good. So, um, I, I, I ended up, after reading this article, I ended up spending way too much time than I would like to admit looking for footage of CeeLo Green performing with the Rock of Fire Explosion show. Because <laughs> it says that in the article, because a, a couple of years ago, the Rock of Fire Explosion show, which all but disappeared, became popular again. Because yeah. this guy who created the Rock of Fire Explosion show, he still had a big, giant, working Rock of Fire Explosion show band in his in like his shed in the backyard. And so he started programming it to sing popular hits, and he re recorded one and put it on YouTube. And suddenly, everyone cares about the Rock of Fire Explosion show again. Yeah. And so uh, suddenly, like, the Rock of Fire Explosion show is cool. And so CeeLo Green, the guy who sang Crazy, do I, do you think I'm crazy? Oh, my God. Does that make me crazy? <laughs> and then he had a surprising hit with the song Fuck You. Yeah. You don't remember that, Bella? Yeah. I see you driving around town with a girl I know, and I'm like, Fuck you. <laughs> and the song became so popular that he recorded a clean version called Forget You. Yeah. And so CeeLo Green had like a extended run at a big hotel in on the Vegas Strip. And it was a mixture of live songs and recorded songs and, and a big spectacle. And when he sang Fuck You, the Rock of Fire Explosion show came out and did, was his backup band. And he sang over them. Yeah. So all I could, yeah. So all I could find on YouTube was a recording of the Rock of Fire Explosion show doing the backup. I couldn't find the actual performance. And apparently the reason why is because his show in Vegas was so huge that he turned it into a uh, um, a live concert movie. And oh. so, like, I love the Rock Fire Explosion show, but I'm not paying $14.99 yeah. to see this concert show. Anyway, I just love the fact that a very small part of my childhood has a cult following now. <laughs> now Chuck E. Cheese is working on removing all of the animatronic bands from all of their Chuck E. Cheese locations. There's going to be no more robots singing. And there's some shit in the article about how uh, Chuck E. Cheese wants to be, I don't know, like fucking Starbucks or Panera Bread or some shit. Yeah. It's at the end, like, oh, we're going to replace the animatronic band and replace uh, replace that with muted soft colors and wood paneling. And it's like, oh, you're, 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 you're not a fucking, you're not a TGI Fridays. Yeah. Okay? Not at you're all. A, you're, you're, a, you're an ADHD kid. Uh, Opium house. Opium yes. den. No? Now, the article only lightly touches upon Five Nights at Freddy's. But the real reason why Chuck E. Cheese is getting rid of its robots mm -hmm. has to be fucking Five Nights at Freddy's. There's no other reason why suddenly now Chuck E. Cheese is um, getting rid of all of its robots. It has to be because of Five Nights at Freddy's. So you think this, you think the animatronics in Five Nights at Freddy's have have spoiled animatronics? Uh, I'm gonna let Bella. 
Bella, <laughs> the last time we went to Chuck E. Cheese, did you see the audio animatronics and said, oh my god, this is fun, I'm really excited to see these audio animatronics, or were you like, oh my god, they're going to come kill me? <laughs> um, Remember Jaden's birthday party? Yes! You and Amber and Emerald were just freaked the fuck out. Was, was Deanna there? I yeah, feel like... yeah, Deanna was there too. Yeah. Deanna was the one who was like, you guys are being quiet about it. Deanna was the one who was being vocal and Deanna about she it. Deanna was, like, was the one that was like, heck? oh my God, what the me. hell? I didn't know they were here. Is that what this, is that what Freddy's is based on? Oh my God, they're going to kill me. <laughs> Deanna, just can you? It's Jaden's birthday. Can you calm down? Well, I'm sorry. I'm not the one who wanted my birthday at a place where robots are going to come kill us. I hated that so much. They were so creepy. Bella, how many? This is going to be a painful question, but um, how many Five Nights at Freddy's games are there right now? Five, not six. Okay, that was a surprisingly uh, uh, passionate. Question. So, uh, follow up. What the hell are you talking about? Are you talking about the new game that just came yes! out? Yes. Which is a like a like a a For, pizza uh, store simulator where you can kind of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. Okay. It's a. It's not the sixth game. It literally the rest of the game is just Five Nights at Freddy's, Five Nights at Freddy's 2, Five Nights at Freddy's 3, and this one's not it's not Five Nights at Freddy's 6. Okay, now for the uninitiated, Bella, and real quick, try and explain it the the plot of the first Five Nights at Freddy's game. <laughs> okay, I'm just Quickly. talking about the first one. I'm just talking about the first one, because I know that there's like a ridiculous freaking mythology in this stupid thing. Quickly. Yeah, just just explain the first game. Just explain the first game while I lower the YouTube. Um, well, there's a guy that works at the the uh, pizzeria called Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Yeah, and he like works there with his. He works there and he takes his daughter there or something. I don't know. The whole something. game is in first person. You're this guy yeah. and you're a night watchman. Well, not not necessarily, but wh whatever. Um, you. Uh, so this guy who works there, like, it never explains anything that happens to him, but something happens, and he basically goes insane and kills five children. All right. Okay, like, hey, so you're talking about the the background of the story. I was talking about the actual game, but no, go ahead. So some guy who works at Freddy Fazbear's goes nuts and kills children. Yes. Okay. Um, he kills the children, and then he's like, oh, crap, I actually killed them. They're, like, dead. They're actually dead. Well, I don't know what to do with them. I guess I'll just shove them in these animatronic suits. And he does <laughs> that. And, like, I don't know. They... Come they, to life. They're, yeah, they're they filled with the spirits life. of the kids or something. And that's where the first game is. Like they come to life and then the you work at the pizzeria and they they they're alive and they come and try to kill you because you're dressed like you're dressed as a security guard. And that's exactly what the the, the guy was. Yeah, that's exactly what the guy was. Yeah. And then eventually one thing leads to another and then the spirits come back and haunt the guy who killed them and then he ends up hiding from them in another animatronic suit. It's like a spring lock suit and there's water dripping from the ceiling because the freaking the pizzeria sucks. And so <laughs> it triggers the box and it like basically all the metallic part clamps shut and he dies. And other things that I don't want to go into because so much. Yeah, there, there's it, basically you have to survive five nights as the night watchman security guard guy at this area really where the audio animatronics are coming to life and trying to kill you. It it I is guess. interesting that it just happens to be a pizza place. <laughs> Let me tell you something, buddy. Let me tell you uh, something about this girl next to me, uh, uh, Isabella. Yeah. Um. I have seen her watch YouTube videos. You remember how people used to talk about Lost? 
Yeah. You remember how people used to talk about that? Okay, now, you remember season three, episode eight, where you saw the guy and he had the blue ring? Okay, now remember that. Now let's jump to season five. Okay, now in season five, you saw a guy and he was wearing a blue suit. Now, if that guy, his name was Frank. Now, if you put Frank backwards, that's what you see on the ship in season two. Okay, so, now, what <laughs> if happened in reverse, basically? There are hour-long videos like that on YouTube for this fucking video game series. For Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> yeah, for Five Nights at Freddy's. There is a mythology so uh, deep and so rich. And here's the important part. So vague. So vague. <laughs> so vague. There are like there are like you, you, like the first game is really straightforward, but then they then like after season after the second game and after the third game, they they started adding these little bits and pieces. And oh wait, maybe this game actually happened time wise before this game. And then there's this <laughs> game, and then there's this game, and this game is like uh oh uh if you play this in a specific way, you get these mini games. And these mini games are like eight bit video games, and you don't realize it at all what you're supposed to do because they don't tell you. But this is secretly the background of this character, and uh -huh. it's it's freaking insane! It is freaking insane. <laughs> this thing is so popular now too. We just started getting a, a really lengthy novelizations. The, 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 um, the book, the yeah, those two books one. that I got, Chuck. Twisted, the twisted ones. That's that's the second yep. book, I think, and the other one. I yeah, no and there's a third one, but it's not coming out until next year. Ah, I made it. I'm gonna get that for me. The interesting thing is that the Five Nights at Freddy's game series was originally created by like these Christian guys. Yeah, and what they originally wanted was, can we make like a scary video game that doesn't involve a bunch of gore and profanity. Oh, excuse me. Like yeah. a clean sort of no. game. And so that's why, you know, so many of these Five Nights at Freddy's games are really just Five Nights of Jump Scares. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't know what, the, what else to do. Yeah. <laughs> These games have become super popular and insane, and we've got books, and we've got guidebooks, There's and we've got toys. We've got um, Funko Pops, because everything in the world will have a Funko Pop. I'm pretty sure they're already working on the Pope on Film Funko Pops. Uh, they fucking better be, that's all i got to say. Yeah. And um, then... Next door at Toys R Us, there's a whole aisle of Five Nights at Freddy's stuff. There's a whole aisle of Five Nights at Freddy's stuff. One of the kids at uh, Maxwell's bus stop wears this uh, Freddy Fazbear's hoodie sometimes. Yeah. And, and we'll be in the van because I don't want Maxwell to freeze. And we're just waiting there and he'll sneak up to the window in the Freddy Fazbear's outfit and Maxwell starts screaming. <laughs> So that's that's fun for us. Yay! Yeah. But yes, yeah, so suddenly Chuck E. Cheese is all, "Hey, we're going to be getting rid of our robots to save money, and not I at know. all because audio animatronic pizza bands have been ruined for life." Yeah. Yeah. So there's five and a half video games right now. They're working on a movie. They're working on their third book, and all the books are super popular and sell a bunch. Uh, I, 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 I still see a bunch of kids with uh, shirts and stuff, and uh, uh, a certain someone might be getting a Five Nights at Freddy's thing or two this Christmas. Yeah. Uh, I wonder who that is. Talking about? Talking about mom. <laughs> That's so sketchy. sketchy. Dog. That's good. But yeah, the reason why they're getting rid of freaking uh, the audio animatronic bands has nothing whatsoever to do with saving money or this and that, yada yada. It has to do with Five Nights at Freddy. Five Nights at Freddy's has ruined Chuck E. Cheese, and now they're trying to reinvent themselves. Side note, one of the last times that we went to the California State Fair, yeah, 
Every time we went to the fair, we spent a ridiculous amount of times checking out the county the booths. That's yeah. Because my dad would always take me to the Arizona State Fair, and I'm like, let's go to this ride. Let's go to this ride. Or let's see this. Hey, there's going to be a free monster truck show, or maybe we can go to this concert, or maybe we can go to this. No. We're going to go to every educational booth at this fair. No, oh. oh, but I want to go on this ride. No, Stevie. Let's go look at every county exhibit. After that, we'll go look and see at every science exhibit and which ones won first place. <laughs> After that, we will go and see every animal at the livestock exhibit. And I'm like, oh, God damn it. This is so boring. But so, <laughs> so now I'm older and my parents are gone and I have kids. And I'm like, we're going to go to the fair. Isn't this going to be fun? And they're like, oh, yeah, I want to go on these rides. Nope. Instead, let's go walk over to this county exhibit. I never thought the rides were getting anyway. Yeah, the rides are just variations of getting spun. Yeah. Here, we're going to spin you this way. I'm going to spin you this way. No, I'm going to spin you that way. That's every ride at the fair. So, <laughs> so I would we, we would spend like like an hour or two at the county exhibit, and I'd be just be telling the kids, "Hey, kids, aren't you excited? It's Mendocino County." It, like, I'd be, like, hyping it up, like, ridiculous. It's like, kids, do you have county fever? County fever! But, but there's, there, I freaked out the last time we went to the California State Fair because one of the county booths was apparently someone in the county board of supervisors okay. knew someone who, who had a, Rock of Fire Explosion Show robot. Really? Because the surfer... Yeah, because the surfer drummer dog from the Rock of Fire Explosion Show was repurposed as being a guy fishing at, at their booth talking about all the wonders of Monterey County. Why, hey there. <laughs> Welcome to Mon Monterey County. We are the sixth largest county in California. Come Monterey Bay. Hey, home of the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium. And it's like walking through all the exhibits going, oh, hey, this is a cool county. Oh, hey, I think they have uh, free uh, lollipops. We should go. <gasps> oh, my God. You're from the Rock of Fire Explosion Show. No one has any idea why I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, like no one has it. Like I'm freaking out and like no one has any idea. Like, why is that Mexican throwing a scene? And I'm like, you have no idea. He's from the Rock of Fire Explosion Show. They were huge. At one pizza place in, in, in Glendale, Arizona. <laughs> yeah. So, so when and that did you, is it when for did homework you, this week. Well, when did you go from there to Peter Piper's Pizza? Oh, I always uh, went to Peter Piper Pizza. Oh, even, even in uh, the Peter show? Piper even in the showbiz pizza days? Showbiz pizza, they had like two or three restaurants in Phoenix. And it just so happened that one of them was near my school. Yeah. Peter Piper Pizza got its start in Phoenix, and now it's freaking everywhere. In fact, there is one about 15 minutes away from my work. Really? In Moore. Oklahoma. They opened a Peter Piper Pizza in Moore, Oklahoma. They opened one in Oklahoma City, and they opened one in Midwest City. And it, 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 the Peter Piper Pizza that I went to, like Natasha and I have been to Peter Piper Pizza twice uh, here in Oklahoma, and it's it it's not the same yeah. because the pizza, the Peter Piper Pizza that we eat here in Oklahoma is actually um good. <laughs> So it's like, oh, wait, this pizza is wonderful. This can't be Peter Piper pizza. It tasted a lot more like cardboard, but <laughs> uh, you know what? They got everything else down. Yeah. But but Peter Piper pizza, Peter Piper pizza in Phoenix is like McDonald's. There's just one everywhere. Uh-huh. Like, like there were about four Peter Piper pizzas around my house. 
They haven't gotten here yet. But they slowly but surely are. In fact, uh, what I read was that Peter Piper Pizza was so big in Arizona that it was purchased about five years ago. Pause for dramatic effect. By Chuck E. Cheese. What? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So now Chuck E. Cheese is trying to uh, slowly but surely, like, uh, what's the word? Colonize Peter Piper Pizza all over America, which is why now we're here in Oklahoma and there's just like, Three Chucky, three Peter Piper pizzas. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, and right by the bathrooms at the Peter Piper Pizza, they have a bit of the history of Peter Piper Pizza. Peter yeah. Piper Pizza got its start as a small restaurant on uh, uh, in uh, 31st Avenue and Glendale in Glendale, Arizona. And I'm like, oh, shit, that's like three oh blocks. God, I just remembered that's like three Lord. streets away from my house. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was the place that all the cool kids would go after, like, the football games in high school. They would go over there and, and uh, party after every, like, sporting event. They would go to that Peter Piper pizza. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that was the first ever Peter Piper pizza. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it hasn't gotten to Colorado yet, but it's on its way. It is on its <laughs> way. It's surely getting everywhere. The pizza is a lot better, so it, 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 it's, it's not the same. But um, <laughs> while I was telling this story, uh, Bella... Um, suddenly uh, st straightened her posture and uh, seems really excited. She's chopping at the bit for something. What are you saying? What were you going to say, Bella? The actual origins of Five Nights at Freddy's, like where they got the idea to make it. Um, They went to a Chuck E. Cheese and got drunk? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, well, tell the story. I'm going to get another beer. Uh, it was something like, it was a story back in the like the 1900s, something, something between the 1900s and the 2000s. I don't know. Some like a lot of people died. Like four, like five, four. They were actually five people involved, but only four of the people died. Yeah. Well, no, there were six people involved: the murder and then the five victims. Only four of them died, and then one of them survived. They were murdered in a pizza place, and like the positions that the characters. Like in Five Nights, that the characters that are in Five Nights at Freddy's, where they usually are, are where those people were killed. Really? Okay. Yes! I have no idea anything else, but it was a murder and it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was amazing to hear about it. But human murder can be kind of amazing too. So. <laughs> yes, it, yes, it can. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I love you, Bella. I love you too. And that is it for homework this week. And we genuinely and honestly, so Jen on you in Estlily. <laughs> we really do hope that your hearts, minds, and chest cavities have all been suitably open. Ah, uh, but don't think, don't think you're getting out of here that easily, amigo. Don't forget. Next week's homework assignment, and for next week, for our next episode, yes. I should say, we are going back to a theme that is one of our personal favorites here on the Popon Film. I am talking, of course, about Christian propaganda! Oh! What's the last Christian propaganda we've done? No freaking clue. No freaking clue. That's why we need a historian. Yeah. Who is really upset with us in our show. <laughs> Next week, we will be watching a uh, direct -to video special that might be from the 80s or maybe the 90s. There's actually very little info about this video out there on the internet, which is surprising. It's called Idol Busters. Okay. Idol Busters. like Ghost Busters, except they're busting false idols. It's Idol Busters, and it features a special appearance by 80s Christian mainstay, Carmen. Carmen. Calm down, buddy. Carmen. You remember Carmen? No. 
But if you saw a picture of him and his curly ass hair uh, and his like beautiful looks, you might remember Carmen. I remember Carmen. I, I, I he was might. a big deal in like like in the eighties. It's like the old name of of any anyone that anyone remembers from like Christian music in the eighties. But Carmen, <laughs> I don't know about you, but Carmen made my no no tingly growing up. A lot of mixed feelings there. <laughs> Anyway, it's basically like a Christian SNL. It's Christian SNL for young people. It's on YouTube, and we're going to rip it a new one. All right. Should be fun. Idol That is next week, so join us next time. Idol Busters. (laughs) So join us next week for more homework with the Pope on Film Podcast. And cut! Mm. Mm. Oh, so we still have a movie to get to. Yes. Um, I don't have the most for that, and a a a, a good book I have just came from last year. A what? So they, I don't have a lot for for the movie <laughs> this week, and a lot of what I have just came from last year. Just being honest. Pretty much. Yeah, and maybe that's no, maybe that's gonna... what we should maybe that's what we should do, you know, not only do the same movie every year, do the same exact podcast. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you have said that because I I found my notes from last year. Yes, I found my notes. It was episode 105. So a lot of what I have to say about this movie literally just came from last year. In fact, the opening is just talking about what we were talking about last year because I've got all the notes right here. It's quite interesting what we were talking about this time last year. Cool. Save those notes. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we still have a lot to get to. Not a lot to get to. We still have some stuff to get to. But before we get to that, maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. Thank you for not saying anything, Bella, because I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you, and you realized that. Thank you, Bella. When I go nuts, I'm going to kill you last. <laughs> out, of res- out of respect. We will be right back with more of the uh, Pope on Film no, when I- after these commercial messages. When I kill you, I'm going to kill you first because I love you more. Aw, thank you. Aww. You see, you see the can's blue there. You see that? <laughs> that means that it's yes, cold. It, it says right there, when the mountains turn blue, it's as cold as the Rockies. If oh, this, that's cold! If the mountain wasn't blue, then it wouldn't be cold. It changes for the coldness. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Mine. Uh, I drink bad beer. This is not good beer. <laughs> but it's my not good beer. <laughs> yeah. See, okay, so these cans have been out for a while. So, okay, see, that's white. This is blue. That's the difference. Oh Boom. That's an old can. It's not cold. Amazing. Yeah, so the cans change color. It's quite interesting. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 Five nights at Freddy's. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Oh, they got that one. Blue softballs. What lovely music for a murder, or two, or three, or nine. Who's this? Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet a dear friend. Nine killed you. Nine shall die. Your wife no fives. But you I will kill. But you can't, Doctor. I am already dead. Here, how are we going to get him off this? You take his head and I'll take his feet. Let's unscrew him. Doctor, five. 
who samples the finer things of life. In his own inimitable way. Because uh, boils and bats. Frogs? Frogs, yes. And the curse of blood. Curse of hail in the bloody middle of nowhere. Are you ready for Dr. Five? And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Well then, Bunny, it's the last Pope on film episode of the holiday season. Yes. Which means, which means that it is time once again to dust off what might be the worst Christmas movie ever made. <laughs> I'm talking about the 1972 Bizarre Kitty movie, Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. Now, this is episode 154 of the Pope on Film podcast, and we now cover this movie, Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, every year for Christmas. This is the second year in a row that we have covered Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, the first time that we discussed Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny was way back in episode 105. Yes. And because I keep ridiculously detailed notes, I have those notes right here in my hand. I've still got the notes from episode 105. And yeah. so it is an yeah, it is an interesting look at uh, uh uh, the podcast for exactly from one year ago. It's interesting to see what what we were up to, what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, in episode one hundred and five, we were still still talking about the new Gilmore Girls movies that Netflix came out with. Yes, despite having just done two full episodes of the show about them. Yes. <laughs> it says right here, speaking of last week, we were talking about the end of Gilmore Girls and who could be the father. I forgot to mention another obvious candidate, Dean. Yes. Dean could be the father of Rory's baby. Dean who's Sam. Not Dean who's Dean. Yeah, Dean who is Sam. Yeah. Not Dean who is Dean. I hate Dean, Dean, Sam. I hate Dean, Sam. I Sam's wife. Yes. Dean, Sam? Yeah. No. Sam, I am. <laughs> also, during last year's episode, uh, I was very upset about the recent Harry Potter Midnight Magic Party that we had. Yeah. Because the weekend before... Uh, we had a uh, uh, Harry Potter Midnight Magic Party, and I told everybody when they were setting up the Midnight Magic Party, I said, hey, I've run about four of these all by myself. And I had a Harry Potter club for kids for about five years, and uh, I know Harry Potter, and I uh, am really good with kids. And so I can help in any way that you guys want me to. I, I I've... I have a number of Harry Potter activities and I know Harry Potter and whatever you need me to do, I will do. And so they said, great. Well, you're definitely going to work the midnight magic party. So they had me work the midnight magic party and that's it. (laughs) Okay. I was very upset about that. They had me do nothing else. And I was telling kids for like weeks, I'm going to be at the Midnight Magic Party if you guys want to be at the Midnight Magic Party. And so I would have kids coming up saying, hi, Mr. Steve, what are you doing today? Oh, just walking around. <laughs> Why? What are you doing? Because I because they gave me nothing. I, I did nothing that night. It felt like a big waste for me. Yeah. It was a successful event, but nobody cared too much uh, uh, about me. Because they didn't give me anything to do, and then, and then uh, they they said that they wanted me to have an event too, so they had me do a midnight match, a Harry Potter story time activity thing, and it was a successful event. But it was after 
the Harry Potter Midnight Magic Party, and so no one cared about what I was doing. A reporter came in, took one look at me, and took the hell off. <laughs> so that was, that was fun. Yeah. So for homework last year, we watched the first installment of the Batman serial. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Serials. That may have been the last serial we did, because I'm just not a big serial fan. Yeah. I, I Yeah, I think that's the only serial that we did. But it was Batman, so we had to do it. Yeah, yeah we it, had to. It was historically Every, valid. Yeah. Every serial is always, oh, there's no way that our hero can escape. Be sure and watch us next week. And then in the beginning of next week, oh, our hero easily escaped via a way that we didn't show you before. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Batman, the original serial, episode one, The Electrical Brain, 1943, during the height of WWII. They really didn't like the Japanese. In the serial, he was originally the... He was... He was called the Batman. So this is before Lorelai Gilmore told the studio to drop the V. Oh, yeah. We were very Gilmore girls one year ago. Netflix really had us <laughs> by the short series. Yes. The, the Batman serial added a number of items to the Batman mythology for the first time. For example, the Batcave didn't exist until it was created for the Batman serial. Also, in the Batman serial, the entrance to the Batcave was behind a giant grandfather clock. Also something that a number of other Batmans used, and that was just for this. Plus, Alfred is a skinny guy and not what he originally was in the comics, which was a bumbling fat guy. Yes. We also talked about the fact that in the, the Superman radio show, they invented kryptonite just so that the guy who did the voice of Superman can actually have a day off every once in a while. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so sick of being Superman on the Superman radio show. I can't get a week off. Why can't a Superman be missing or sick or, oh, he's perfect? Well, why don't we give him a weakness? I don't know. Kryptonite. What the hell? Let's go with that. <laughs> I, I always like those things in a comic book mythology that everyone loves, but that, oh, hey, guess what? Uh, Harley Quinn was created for a cartoon on the WB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was created for a cartoon on the WB. You know why? Because they wanted a character to be voiced by their favorite soap opera actress. That's why <laughs> we have Harley Quinn. Hey, you know Lois Lane's best friend? You know where she came from? The TV show Smallville. <laughs> you know the actress that played her? She's now in a sex cult. <laughs> Seriously, check, uh, Google Smallville actress sex cult. Really? She's in, yeah, she's in some crazy cult now. That, that, that blonde girl uh, uh, comic relief from Smallville. So, uh, we also talked at length last year about something that is still very important to me, something that is near and dear to my heart, something that I cannot talk enough about. I am talking, of course, about John Cena's Instagram account. Yes! This man is too weird for his body. <laughs> And, and, and see, the other day, there he did, um, he was on, uh, what is it, what is that talk show that everyone loves but now everybody hates? Jimmy Fallon, The Jimmy Tonight, Fallon. Show. The Tonight Show, The Tonight Show. He was on The Tonight Show, and he did Mad Lib Theater, where, uh, like, the first five minutes are just Jimmy Fallon doing Mad Libs with John Cena, and then... They immediately after that go into a uh, a, a scene of a, of a skit where all of the things that they say are what John Cena came up with during the Mad Lib portion. Uh huh. And um, some of the answers that John Cena gave were so 
it, it, it's not that the answers that John Cena gave were so weird and bizarre and out of left field, but the weird part was that he was able to come up with them so rapid. Yeah. Like, like literally, John Cena says, what is an advice? What, uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon says to John Cena, what is advice that you would give to a teenage boy? And immediately, without even thinking, he just blurts out, stay gold, pony boy. <laughs> nice. And everyone's nice. laughing and laughing. And then it's like, OK, this is the g- OK. So so this is a, a good reason why this man has the weirdest Instagram account. <laughs> The man who comes up with these answers and, and, and Jimmy Fallon's like, give me a description of moist. Moist. <laughs> like, like, really, like, he comes up with, like, the weirdest answers at, at, at a moment's notice off the top of his head. And I'm like, yeah, okay, this is the guy with the weirdest Instagram account in the world. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. So, yeah, everyone should go see Again, everyone should go see John Cena's Instagram account. It's amazing. Yeah. So I hope that this will be a tradition for us every year. We will watch the same shitty movie and roast it. Now, this year, we wanted to do the Jack and the Beanstalk version, but for the life of me, I could not find the Jack and the Beanstalk version. The only version that I could find that had the Jack and the Beanstalk, I, I could, I found one version of Santa Claus and the Money that had Jack and the Beanstalk in it yeah but it was riff tracks live did it riff tracks made did riff tracks did santa claus and the ice cream bunny but then when they did riff tracks live present santa claus and the ice cream bunny they said hey uh, how many of you have seen our riff tracks live of santa claus and the ice cream bunny and everyone's cheering and they said yeah that's what we thought that's why we're doing the jack and the beanstalk version this time (laughs) and as far as i could tell that's the only available place where you can find the Jack and the Beanstalk version of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. But I couldn't find Riff Tracks Live Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny for free. And I'm not paying any amount of money for Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny because fuck that. <laughs> yes. And I, I looked agree. and looked and looked. Yeah, I just looked and looked and looked. I couldn't find it anywhere. So. I'm not cheating here, but for the stats, I've got my notes from last year. It's an interesting story of the making of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. This week's movie is so bad that a lot of people, including some people out there who consider themselves bad movie lovers, have never even heard of this movie, let alone seen it. It's an under-the-radar sort of a bad movie. The basic plot is that Santa Claus, who it should be noted, rates a 9.5 on the Joe Don Baker sweat meter. (laughs) Yes. Santa Claus crashes his sled on a beach in Florida, and a bunch of uh, uh, people try and get Santa out of the sand. Then out of nowhere, a whole different movie breaks out. Uh Uh-huh. Ho, 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 kids, don't worry. I'm sure I'll get out of this. In fact, let's watch another movie. And so, the mo- and then the movie within a movie is actually much, 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 much longer than all of this Santa crap. Um, actually, there's another bit to this, because in the movie within a movie, the character of Thumbelina visits a pirate-themed theme park in Florida post-Disney. They visit Pirate Land Amusement Park, for no reason whatsoever. So it's a movie within a movie within a movie. It's a, it, it's a bad movie section. Yes. Um, so this is a 1972 kids movie. And it's important to know that at that point in time in Hollywood, um, basically all of Hollywood seemed to think like, oh, Let's make a movie. Let's make a good movie, a smart movie. This would be a funny movie. This would be a great movie. Oh, this is a movie for kids? Okay. Remember, everybody, kids are stupid. Yes. Remember, everybody, kids are really fucking stupid, so let's just dumb this down, okay? Let's dumb this down. Let's dumb this down. Uh, What level are we at? 
We're at Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Okay, we need to be lower than that. This is a movie for kids. <laughs> so, in order to talk about Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, we need to talk about nudie cuties. I was obsessed with nudie cuties for a while. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to be a big fan of the monster of Camp Sunshine, which is basically like, which is basically like Jason, except Jason is attacking a nude, a, a nude resort. They should totally do that. It, it, yeah, yeah, that's the monster of Camp Sunshine. Nudie Cuties were softcore nude movies from primarily the 50s and 60s, featured uh, some toplessness, select bottomlessness, no vagina, uh, and the literally the broadest humor this side of hee haw. Yes. Uh, nudes on the moon, nudes, uh, Nakedsville, USA. Uh, Naked University, nudes Topless Beach. Nudes on the Moon, isn't that one from uh, Chesty Morgan director? Yes, Doris Wishman. Yes. I am shocked that I knew that name immediately. <laughs> there is something wrong with me when I cannot find my keys or where I put my cell phone, but you say... Uh, you say nudes on the moon, and I go, yes, of course, that was Doris Wishman. <laughs> like, that's the knowledge I can easily regurgitate. Yeah. So, nudie cuties were a thing, dimly lit grindhouse theaters full of men in long trench coats. Um, the leading director in the world of nudie cuties was a guy by the name of Barry Mahon. Yeah. He was a veteran in World War II. I know this because Wikipedia, and I'm like, uh, a lot of times we do a bad movie, and so you look up Wikipedia, I'm going to Wikipedia this movie, and here's like a small Wikipedia page. And then you go, oh, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a thing for the director. I'm going to click the director's name, and here's a little thing for the director. Uh, Barry Mahon has one of the longest director's Wikipedia pages in the history of Wikipedia. And I'm like, wait a second, why does this director have like a have like a, a Guillermo del Toro length fucking Wikipedia page? Yeah. It turns out he was in World War II and he was taken prisoner and he uh, got a bunch of the other prisoners and together they uh, tried to make uh, uh, an escape and they were successful and they made a movie about it called The Great Escape. Yes. The movie The Great Escape that. is a prequel to Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. <laughs> important to note this. Barry Mahon directed over 60 films in his lifetime. He was also a prolific producer in junk. Um, he, so much of his first films were nudie cuties. Forbidden Flesh, Nudes on Tiger Reef, The Love Cult, The Beast That Killed Women, Nudes A Go-Go, Bottoms Up, The Diary of Knockers Macala. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds like a character in a cutscene of a video game. Yeah, like I can already like I can, if I can close my eyes, I can picture the video game that features you going into a saloon and talking with Knockers Macala, who gives <laughs> you your, your next task. Yeah. But he also directed such great non nudie stinkers as Pagan Island, Cuban Rebel Girls and Rocket Attack USA, which was in a very early episode of Mystery Science Theater. It's a Joel episode, and Joel episodes are always really, really good. Yes. I never like Mike. And I and uh, Jonah Ray, who is now the host of Mystery Science Theater. They, let me tell you what I do not like about Jonah Ray. Okay. Now that we got Hulu, I've been binge watching uh, Drunk History anytime that I can. And um, he is in an episode of Drunk History. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I am Jonah Ray Rodriguez. Okay. And I'm going to be telling you the history of Hawaii. And oh, 
He's Jonah Ray Rodriguez, and he goes nowhere with his career. He just becomes Jonah Ray, and guess what? You're the new Joel. Yeah. My new, I in in fact, I'm just gonna go by my first name and my middle name, and that's gonna, I'm gonna become a huge star. Now my name is just Stephen Christian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Steve Christian. Hi, Steve <laughs> Christian. I'm in insurance. Is is that your real middle name? Yeah. Oh, how'd they do that? Uh, too? My 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 real name, which I hate, is Esteban Cristian Galindo. And when I tell people my real name, they go, oh, I like the name Esteban. That's really nice. And I go, yeah, I hate it. And they say, why do you hate it? And then I say, well, if someone's name is Esteban, there are a lot of things. You say. Like this man speaks Spanish and this man has a culture that he knows about. Yeah. So, Psych. yeah. 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 So I, I just absolutely hate it. But it's important to note that my dad made a big, huge point of naming my older brother after him and passing the name. And when the second child came along, um, my wife went to my, 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 my mom went to my dad and said, so what should we name this second child? And my dad said, Oh, I don't care. I already have my firstborn son. So, so this one can be named whatever you want. And so my mom being my mom said, okay, because I'm reading a book and there's a character and his name is Steven Christian. He's a Nazi, but he's one of the good ones. <laughs> he's one of the really good Nazis. And he's like the hero Nazi that saves the day. And my dad just went, okay, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, I'm named after Steven Christian, the Nazi, which is horrible. Which is horrible, but on the positive side, they did make a movie about this book, and I was played by Marlon Brando. So I guess that's okay, yeah. It's slightly better. So he's a good Nazi. So the story goes like this. Barry Mahon, uh, he escaped in World War II, and then he's making nudie cuties. But eventually the nudie cuties just dry up in the 60s because people, because in the beginning of the 60s, they're like, ooh, we can still make these movies where you might be able to see a woman's boobs. But then the 60s keeps going, and suddenly there's all this, like, uh, violence and rape. And so suddenly seeing uh, nude chefs isn't, <laughs> viable option for making a quick buck so in so then in the late 60s in dania florida they open up a 78 acre theme park called pirates world and uh it's a theme park and it's pretty big but it's even bigger as a concert venue david bowie played there the rolling stones the grateful dead led zeppelin so 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 this was a, a big theme park and an even bigger concert venue and everybody played there and it was huge and they were making a huge amount of money until suddenly Walt Disney right before he died said we're making a park another park. we're calling it Walt Disney World it'll be the first ever theme park in Florida <laughs> Yes I Walt Disney right before I died I'm making Florida's first theme park. <laughs> Thank you, Bella. Uh, thanks to me, Walt Disney, we're going to make Florida great again. <laughs> Everybody used to walk around with Mafaga shirts, Mafaga, with Mafaga hats. <laughs> make Florida great again. Mafaga. <laughs> <laughs> That was great, Bella. That was great. You you did really, really like kudos to you. You get a gold star. Yes. So suddenly Pirate World is struggling and the owners are desperate to try and bring people to the frickin' park. So they came up with what if we make a series of really cheap ass movies in the park, around the park, and so the movies will advertise the park, the park will advertise the movies, and as it so happens. Um, uh, Mr. Nudie Cutie Barry Mahon had just stopped making nudie cuties because no one wanted uh, uh, cutesy tongue-in-cheek nude films anymore. 
So he just started making cheap, low budget kids movies. He did a uh, Wizard of Oz. He did a Thumbelina. He did a Jack and the Beanstalk, and he's like not sure what to do next. And so um, he's, he's said no. So he's so he's done thumb. He's done the he's done Jack and the Beanstalk, and he's working on a place to do Thumbelina and the Wizard of Oz, and he has no place to film. And as it just so happens, uh, pirates. He's looking for a place to film, and Pirate World say, "Hey." You're a director looking to make a movie. Hey, come on in. We'll let you film your Wizard of Oz film here. And uh, what other movie you want to do? Thumbelina? That's great, too. Now, let us let me talk to you about our plans. <laughs> so after the Oz movie, Barry Mahon makes a series of movies with Pirate's World as its center. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so he made... Jack and the Beanstalk there. He made Thumbelina there. He did a musical documentary. And uh, all these three came out in 1970. And by 1971, Walt Disney World was actually open. And so uh, Pirate World declared bankruptcy in 1973. But they said, oh, maybe maybe we can still survive if we just come up with one more movie. Barry Mahon, make another movie for us. And Barry Mahon said, great, there's only one problem. Uh, I have no money. Do you guys have any money? And Pirate World is like, oh, we don't have any money. So, oh, so how can we make a movie with no money? And so instead of creating a new movie, they just filmed about, you know, 20 minutes of silent film footage that they badly dubbed later yeah. and then shoved one of their pre-existing into the middle of it. And that is the story of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. <laughs> It's amazing. It is incredible. It is a cheap ass film. It is stupid and dumb and wonderful. And uh, I love this film. I love this film. And uh, it really is a great film to show to people to, you know, because there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people out there that don't realize the importance of Life Day. No. And you really gotta, you know, if you want to show someone, how important life day is. This is a great, a great film to show them, you know? Yeah. You're right. And, and what it means and about friendship too. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a massive plot synopsis, but I don't think it's, it's, uh, I don't think it's necessary. This movie is shit. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. 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 So um, that's all I got. Uh, we are going to be taking the week off next week um, just because we just haven't taken a week off for a while. Yeah. But next, but the our next episode, uh, episode 155, Jesus Christ, we're going to be uh, for homework. We're watching Idol Busters. Yes. Idol. I-D-O-L Busters. Uh, I've got a, a a brand new bit of news smatterings, which I'm very excited about. Okay. And um, I wasn't sure what movie we should do. I wasn't sure what movie we should do. And I was looking around for movies we should do. And then society told me what movie we should do. What did society tell you? We need to do Will Smith's new movie. The one on the made for Netflix thing? Yeah. As far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, it is a big budget summer blockbuster. It's just being released on December 22nd on fucking Netflix. But as far as I can tell, with the quality of the film, yeah, effects and all of that, they literally Netflix could have just said, screw Netflix, let's just release this in theaters, like in May or June or July or August, and they could have made a shit ton of money, and I don't know why they didn't do that, because yeah. as far as I can tell, this is just a big huge movie, a, a serious actual film, it's just being released on my TV box in like six hours from now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen the little things about it. It looks like some kind of science fiction. He's got some sort of alien partner or something. 
yeah, it's basically like science, like a like a like fantasy is real, and so Will Smith is just a cop, but in a world of uh, orcs and elves and fairies and magic. So how do you, how are you how are you to be a cop in that world? So it's the last action hero, kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's the world needed another one of those. It might be good, but it might be shit. Either way, it'll be entertaining. And uh, yeah, I, I, the previews look good. I kind of want to see it. Let's do it. It's called Bright. Bright. That's a horrible name. It's like Will Ferrell and uh, Amy Poehler's The House. <laughs> oh, what a catchy film. There hasn't been a movie called House before. Except for the Japanese one. Yeah. And then the uh, 80s horror movie one. And then the other 80s horror movie one. And then the house on the left. Yeah. I want to make a film called The House Next Door to the House on the Left. And so there's like yeah. the house on the. So then there's like the house on the left, and there's like people being killed and raped. But then there's like the neighbors. N- the house next door to the house on the left where the people are like, you know, the neighbor's bush is still growing into our yard. You should go over there and talk to them. (laughs) Yes. Uh And like someone in the house on the left is being like cut into pieces with a chainsaw. And, but then the neighbors are like, do they have a chainsaw running? It's nine 45 and we have kids. (laughs) You should go over there and talk to them. Yeah, that's my that's my film. The house next door to the house on the left. I uh, yeah yeah I think that could be a winner. Uh, I think so too. Yay! But anyway, next week, next the next episode, episode one five five. That's going to be huge. But until then, I think this has been a good episode. I think this has been a damn good episode. I you know what I I agree. I think this has been pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve. And um, so 2017 is, is, is ending. And I just want to say that I love you, Bunny. I love you. I love so you, So much. Rev. And thank you for still doing this podcast with me and it's really awesome and I love it and I love you and Jeannie and thank you and I appreciate all the hard work that you do for this podcast. Oh, thank and you. I, no worries. And I hope you have a really good Christmas and a happy new year. The very same to you. Okay. So for... Bella and Maxwell and Eleanor and Natasha and to a lesser extent Emerald and Amber I just want to say thanks for listening sincerely thanks for listening and we will see you next week you godless heathens and you do sparkle thank you Bella do 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 not wipe your wet hands on Maxwell while he's sleeping. Who knows what he's dreaming about? He could be dreaming about Iron Man, and suddenly Iron Man is rubbing his wet hands all over him. <laughs> you're, you're, you're really fucking with his dreams, Bella. Don't do that ever again. Okay? He's dreaming that he's fighting Venom, and suddenly he feels these wet hands all over him. You just turned him into a symbiote. Bob. <laughs> Fucking with his dreams. Okay, I'll do it the next time we're all Do not do it again. Do 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 cut and print. Cut and print. Are you ready? Let's do it. One, two, three. Windows up. Drive it like you stole it. Put on the gas in the motor.
Officer Ward, what happened? I got a dude in my car, and the whole world is watching. Our nation's first Orcas police officer. I can't fuck up my pension. Hey, don't get me stabbed. Wild Orcs always gotta be the bad guys. Danger, danger. I don't fit in, I'm a stranger. So that night, we responded to a 415 disturbance call. It immediately took fire. You all right? No holes? Only the ones I was born with. Are you holes? But fucking you make a shootout awkward. Believe em, believe em. Hey! I can take out all the evil. It's a magic wand. This is like a nuclear weapon that grants wishes. And it just went really sideways from that point. I've only seen magic strong and kill. Look, I didn't come to do the struggle just to let a little trouble knock me out of my position. The devil is coming. We have to protect the wand. So I need to know that you got my back. Are you a cop first or an orc first? It's time to end this. Fuck it. I want to die. Let's do it. We're going to titty bar gunfight die. Hiding all my dreams and the nightmares. Hiding out losing when I was right there. Now I'm so far that it feels like it's all gone to pieces. Tell me why the world never fights fair. Butterfingers. We were doing so good. Someone take me! Are we friends? I think we should spend our time just trying to survive this shit. If we do this, we'll be heroes forever. I need you to take your fat Shrek looking ass back to fuck home to Fiona. All right?